Well, I, I can uh, I can I can kick this off a little bit uh, by providing some information. Um, I'm normally, I'm usually, if I have a conflict with somebody, I'm usually very quiet about it. I just let them go about their, you know, going about their business, and I'm going to go about mine. But you know, if there it comes a point when the the other side just, you know, continues to 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 uh, perpetuate. The problem so if I just remain silent now it becomes something else so I'll address a few issues real quick because I've had some emails asking me and some comments on YouTube so let, let, let's just clear the air on a couple issues one of them one of them concerns J dreamers now a lot of people have commented on my channel out of ignorance they don't know now Jason Tice J dreamers is very good at playing the victim but he took a video that was behind a paywall and he really edited the shit out of it in order to make himself look like, you know, he's the good guy here. But the truth is, is that video was only meant for those who are on Arcade's TV. I told nothing but the truth. But he did not tell his community about the post he released about Archaic's errands. We have the screenshots of that post. Dino posted them on Facebook. You know, J Dreamers attacked the entire community. So, uh, I never publicized that. And, and when I sent him an email, I told him, hey, man, I forgive you, dude. But with forgiveness, that doesn't mean that uh, I want to have any more contact with you. So, I let it go. And then he pulled that stunt on YouTube. On, on YouTube. And that's fine. That's cool. Because, like I said, I've washed my hands with it. I'm moving forward. But a lot of people don't know because I don't just, I'm not messy. I'm not going to post all these things on YouTube. But Don seen them. Dino on Facebook. Many people saw the post that J Dreamers did. Now, he rescinded it and took it off of his channel. But a lot of people never saw it. So, they didn't know why I made the decision I did to end, end any, any, any more communication with J Dreamers. But because he continues to play victim and try to publicize this, it's time for you to know. I said, this is, this is what the, the original issue was. So, having said that, having said that, we move on to Soul Luckman. A lot of you realize that Soul Luckman is really no longer a part of the Archaics family. Uh, he was introduced into the family, and we did some videos together, and a lot of people didn't resonate with him. I got a lot of emails about him. They weren't feeling the spirit with him when he well, when he talked in his videos, uh, and all that was okay. I still, I still, I still continued the relationship, but you know, he started the Errant Fest deal, and he put me, and he almost got me into a contractual agreement with a lady from Mexico who does all kinds of events a speaker's contract, and I had already told the same individual about four times through three different individuals that I'm not interested in working with her. So Lugman kind of went through the back door, and uh, she she was the one organizing the whole Errant Fest where he, where he literally got 11 speakers off of YouTube who already provide free content, and then turned around and was going to put all that behind a paywall. And there's nothing that's, that, could, that YouTube would censor. There's no reason to put all that behind a paywall. I had problems with that, and I told him, but I still told him, you know what? I still you 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 came up with Arab Fest, and you want to do something special? I, okay, a three day event. I don't see the purpose because everything's free on YouTube anyway. But okay, I'll participate because you you did that. And then I got people sending me all these links to his website, and we found a whole a whole merchandise. He was selling all this Errant Fest merchandise and all that. You know what? It doesn't even matter if he if he didn't sell anything. I don't know if he did or didn't, but we we found it and confronted him about it, and he just kind of got real arrogant about the whole thing. And uh, finally, you know what? I just said, I'll wash my hands of that. So I'm done. I'm done. I'm done with the, I'm done with the Errant Fest. Sell your stuff. Do what you want to do, man. But I, I'm done. And I thought it would have been over. But apparently it's not because he's all over Facebook still still talking about now he's talking about the archaics community uh, talking about Aaron's talking about we're a cult so I just want to put you guys on notice why these things were happening the whole J Dreamers deal happened because he got up in his feelings about something he released a post about my community so Lugman is attacking the community. So these are things that are a no no for me. There's no co there's 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 no backup in me. I'm done. I wash my hands with it. So. This is this needed to be addressed because more and more people were asking me about it, and my silence makes it look like I'm trying to hide something. When, when in essence, all I'm trying to do is not be messy. 
Now, the only the only other issue to 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 uh, open up the floor with real quick is the book report issue yesterday is not as innocuous as you think. This isn't as simple as a man wrote, writing a book, borrowing a bunch of my material. A lot more has come to light since last night. And a lot of details. We have a full chronological makeup on this guy. And listen, I can't even name the names of the big people that I have attacked in the past five or six months who will not debate me. But this is bigger than you think. This man sent me an email and totally admitted to me last night that his agenda was to divide the Archaics community and try to pull as many people into the Ben Davidson Suspicious Observers community because he feels a bunch of people in Archaics probably would lean that way if they heard the whole story. So he wanted to put a book out that actually flavored that by omitting a bunch of the, the real Phoenix data. So this guy, this guy... I, got, I have his emails, I kept them. He's really arrogant. Uh, he, he, he continues to want to discourse with me because that's the agenda. As long as I entertain him and continue to communicate with him and, and continue that dialogue, I'm no longer focusing on the big guys that I was formerly attacking, those who are too scared to debate me. This is all a part of a plan, guys, so I just want to let you know I'm not, I'm not losing my shit. I'm not even going to entertain the dude. I'm not even. I'm about to block him and block his emails. I just don't care. I'm moving forward, but I think my community deserves to know what's going on behind the scenes and stuff. And with that, we can go ahead and do an open Q and A. We don't even have to talk about any of that anymore. Outstanding, man. I feel you, brother. Everything you just said, I I, I get you. I one thing I do want to say is I tell everyone here on Discord is. Being a part of this and doing what we're doing, you just got to stay vigilant. That's all. You just got to stay vigilant because some people just don't. They got agendas. They don't have this community's best interests at heart. But who cares about them people, right? So yeah, anybody right. on stage. Go ahead, Jason. Sorry. Right. And Jason, this is to say, uh, you, you know, you can smell bullshit a mile away and it listening to your report yesterday um i was smelling it as i'm sure everybody else was as well and the this gentleman if we wanted that would be a stretch however i'll be polite <laughs> who is communicating you with you i would go so far as to say it seems obvious to me that he's got marching orders from other places we'll just say that um and <clears throat> it's just good to know how the game is played oh there's no doubt yeah he's he, he's definitely nobody takes a beating like that on a book route he sent me an email last night trying to be, befriend me he literally said this is the opening of the email i read it to dawn she laughed he says damn he said, you, you beat the crap out of my book, but this doesn't mean that we're past the point of being friends. So this is how he opened his email up. And then, he go, then he goes off to, to explain, explain to me that I don't know what, what made him think that he was in the position to, to basically tell my community, hey, look, you have a choice. Here are the facts about archaics. Here are the facts about suspicious observers. You, it's time. It's time to make a decision. We can't. We can't ride the fence no more. We need. Who is this dude? Who are you to tell my community that they have to? They, this is all divide and conquer type shit. I'm gonna tell you now. Like ben Davidson, like ben adults Davidson was in the room with me, we would drink one together. Cause oh, uh, that's a friend of mine. I've had him on yeah, my absolutely. channel. Yeah, there's no. There's no. There's no division here. And as adults in the room, what we're not. I, I, I just, I just take offense, no offense, it, of somebody out there trying to tell me that uh, I have to choose between this or that. Why, why is it that I, if I listen to Suspicious Observer, that somehow that disavows uh, 
me as a, a student in Archaic's universe, as I've been for well over two years now. I mean, I'm taking, like most of us, we take in information and, and twirl around in it a little bit. What, do you, what is it? Chew and spit out the bones or whatever that is? It's... it's and chew it up and spit out the bones. Right. Is that now how we get from here to there, wherever that there may lead one? And, uh, yeah. I, wow. Uh, gotta go through it's the fire. No, it's, no, it's no big deal. It's a, uh, there's all kinds of narratives that I've attacked. And I didn't just attack them, attack them, but I also provide some pretty compelling data sets, and I'm also willing to debate those. But, it's all. It's very simple. It's very simple, but it's not something yeah. that, that and it's thank not something that you can just keep talking about. And, and because it, it comes to the point where you have to understand uh, understand when a trap is being set, and I'm, I'm not going to walk into it. So, it's we need to change the subject and talk about something else. Yes, sir. All right. Let's uh, let's start this Q and A. Um, we got quite a few people up here um, right now. Uh, anybody? Want to start? I, I don't know who got up here first right now that's on the stage, so if anybody has a question, let's go. Greg? I have a question. Jules. Go ahead, Jules. Um, Jason had spoke about a time when um, constellations were not at the forefront quite yet, that only stars were um, kind of the key to different teachings. Could you give me a basic timeline on when that was? Yes, I can. I can. Um, I, I do have a video where I show a chart that I drew, and the chart shows the time periods in history when the Zodiac was recognized, when the Zodiac was being developed as the Mool Appen in, in ancient Babylonia, uh, post, uh, well, first of all, it's post Akkad Babylonia. Uh, I show how it was developed all the way through the Hittite period into the Greek period when it, when it reached its full maturity during the Roman period. This is the zodiac that we know of today that involves the passage of the sun through the 12 houses. Unfortunately, for a lot of people, there is zero historical evidence and no, and no one has come forth yet and contended that video. Because you can't. There's nothing from the ancient world that shows that the houses of the Zodiac had any prominence whatsoever 1000 BC and before. They didn't. That's when it was being developed. In 2239 BC at the Great Flood, when the vapor canopy collapsed, that's when the sun was born and all the sun calendars. That's when the patriarchy took over the older matriarchal systems. This is when the priesthoods were born. Temple, temple worship was designed. Over a 500 year period of development, they had, they had, they had basically instituted all new, all new institutions that were focused on the sun. The moon had become very small in the sky because it wasn't magnified by the mesosphere anymore. So it was basically what we see today. The moon had, to the ancients, the moon had lost its power. But we have some very compelling data from Gerald Massey in the 1880s. Not only Gerald Massey, but uh, uh, what is and there's so, there's so many writers from that, that, that period of time that were showing that they can't find any data on the 12 houses of the Zodiac. We can't find any of that. What they find though is a fascination in the ancient world with Orion's belt with the seven stars of the Pleiades, Pleiades, I still can't pronounce that word, the Pleiades, with Alpha Draconis, the Eye of the Dragon, and with the with the Great and the Lesser Bear, Ursa, Ursa Major, Ursa Minor. So, uh, Arcturus, circumpolar, circumpolar stars, and the four corners of heavens, I believe it's Antares, Regulus, there's four, I can't remember what names of them, but there's four, they're called the Royal Stars. Before the, the Zodiacal Belt was there, the heavens were separated into four corners. Called, these are the quadrants, and they formed, they formed the Heavenly Cross. The Heavenly Cross was square, and the four Royal Stars were at the four corners. The Eye of the Dragon was at the top, which makes a gigantic cosmic pyramid. 
four, four corners at the bottom, one corner at the top, where the whole thing rotated. This was the ancient concept. The ancient concept was that we were inside the cosmic pyramid. And uh, these are the older traditions. The oldest traditions are about the seven sisters, the Pleiades, and Arcturus. Also, Orion, the hunter, the dragon of the circumpolar stars called Draconis, and his eye, Alpha Draconis, and how the bear overcame the dragon. This was the most ancient epos. This is what was believed. This is all far older than the development of the Zodiac. So, uh, people like Graham Hancock, and, and there's a lot of them. Not just Graham Hancock. He's just the only one I can, I can name right now. There's a whole bunch of them that try, try to perpetuate the idea that the Zodiac is very ancient. And one of the things that they love to cite is the Zodiac of Dendera. The Zodiac of Dendera is in Egypt, so it sounds like it's really old, doesn't it? And it's a Zodiac, so that's evidence because Egypt is ancient, and if it had a Zodiac, then, well, hell, all this stuff they say about the Zodiac must be true, right? Greek Ptolemies built the Zodiac of Dendera, not the ancient Egyptians. There are no, there are absolutely no representations of the 12 houses of the Zodiac in any ancient Egyptian literature. There are no mentions, mentionings of the Zodiac anywhere in the coffin text, in the ossuaries, on the temple text, none of that. But we have the Seven Sisters. We have Orion, Osiris. We have, we have the appearance of Horus, the sun, at the very end of the stellar pantheon, which is exactly what you would expect. A long period of history studying and watching the stars. The, 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 star, the star watchers, the priesthood, cataloged all this for a long time. And then all of a sudden, a new god is born at the very end of that period, and it was the sun, Horus. And this is exactly what we find with the Sumerian pan pantheon. The Sumerian pantheon has all these Sumerian gods. And at the very end of the Sumerian pantheon, the very end, a new god appears named Utu Shamash. It's the sun. This is because the vapor canopy collapsed and the sun first appeared. This is why all the ancient American systems were called sun calendars. This is why we're waiting for the appearance of the fifth sun right now. So, when it comes to... You, you need to read some books like Stellar Theology and Masonic Astronomy. Uh, it's from the 1800s. Uh, you need to read Gerald Massey. He wrote huge books, but they're worth the money, and you can find them real cheap. As a matter of fact, Booktree publishes the two I read. Well, I actually read three from Booktree. Another one's called Gerald Massey's Lectures. Gerald Massey in the 1850s, 60s, 70s, and 80s basically decoded almost every ancient mythological text he could find. And he put them all together, show the entire narrative, show how they were built, what's old, what's not. Gerald Massey was a man before his time. So uh, th this is where this information comes from. Uh, he's not the only one. There's a, there's a like, uh, Francis Barrett, who wrote the Magus in 1801, collecting a lot. He gives a lot of details, too, about stars being prominent in ancient times, not constellations. The idea of constellations is ancient, but it's only the Seven Sisters, Arcturus, the bowman, and the, uh, the dragon that circled one-third of the stars of heaven, which is Draconis, actually, the constellation Draconis actually does cover over one-third of the distance of the circumpolar stars. But not all, this, not all the heavens, just the circumpolar stars. That's where that myth came from that the dragon covered one-third of the stars and cast them down to Earth. That's, descri that's describing the pole shift and the, and the attendant collapse of the vapor canopy. So, yes, Jason, I, still, I haven't still. heard you mention Sirius at all, and Sirius seems to be in a lot of different lore. Yeah, it does. It, uh, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a fan. I'm, I'm going to tell you why. Uh, we don't have references to Sirius. In the vapor canopy period, it's not one of the older stars that was venerated, but it was very, very venerated after the appearance of the sun. Sirius becomes very prominent in North African, uh, Egyptian, and Mediterranean um, uh, uh, traditions, but it's it's it, but that was during the the reign and the the period of Poseidon. When I say reign of Poseidon, I'm not claiming somebody named Poseidon lived. Reign of Poseidon, or the reign of Zeus, or the reign of Ares. This, these, this, these refer to time periods when Poseidon worship had basically taken over the Mediterranean, like during the Trojan War. 
but uh, Poseidon was Poseidon was represented as the god of the sea, and yet his symbol was a horse, and his main attribute was earthquakes. But uh, the Sirius, the Sirius star, ah, uh, there's a whole lot of attachments to the Sirius star. I'll give you an example. Um, you're familiar with Robert Temple, who wrote about the Dogon. Yes. Would you be well? Would you be uh, willing to do your own research and just just Google anything that was critiquing the whole Dogon story? You're going to be surprised what you find. Robert Temple got famous for reporting that Dogon story about the Dogon of Africa. That they reported all these uh, real scientific observations about the stars and all that. Yeah, and you're going to find a, out. Series B. Yes, you're going to find out real quick. That this has all been dismantled, that most of this was fiction, and this is why he couldn't cite sources. All he could cite was tribal members who told him this. This is why I have a lot of problems with some people that talk about they go to India and they come back and they write these real complex treatises and come up with all these things, and, and they say, well, they got it from a Swami in India, they got it from the Tibetan uh, Tibetan library, they had access to this information, but their bibliography can show anything. Therefore, I must conclude that that I'm reading something that is a product of imagination, creative license. So, it's a uh, same thing with same thing with the channelers. This is I've caught a lot of flack from my own community because there's crossover. People who who have who find value in some of these channelers, like on YouTube, they also listen to archaics, so they don't like it when I tell them that that 100% of the information that comes from a channeler is information that I will absolutely avoid, like the plague. Too many times, channeled information was taken at face value, and then it was then it was found to be wrong. So, if anything is found to be wrong, I have to I have to get rid of the whole thing. There's no bibliography. There's nothing I can research. I am literally accepting the imagination of another individual and trying to call it as a fact. I can't do it. I can't do it. The whole the whole epos surrounding the Sirius star is also the same way. It's relatively new to history. It's not old. Now, you want to know something that's very, very ancient? That there are abs... Archaeologists have found star almanacs that go back a long time. And, they're, and they are absolutely precise. This is the belief systems of the ancient Americas concerning Venus and all of its movements. They didn't care about Sirius. They, they, they were observing Venus in both hemispheres. Yeah, Sirius, Sirius wasn't Sirius wasn't even on the map until like the middle Middle Kingdom, uh, Egypt, and then it wasn't prominent then either. Hmm. All right, thank you for clearing that up. Yeah, Gerald Massey was somebody you you should look into. Uh, Paul Tice of the Book Tree; those books are real cheap. He, he you know he provides all these old books as uh, uh, new paperbacks, and so I would always uh, I would first Google Gerald Massey. Uh, ancient Egypt, Light of the World, or the Light of Egypt. I think it's the Light of Egypt, Volume One and Volume Two. Gerald Massey, eighteen eighties. I would, I would certainly try to find free PDFs first. That's great. Thank you, thank you Jules. Yeah, that was an awesome question. Clarity. All right, Greg, go ahead. You got something? Oh, Greg. Jamie, you got a question? Jamie's got his mouth on a beer. Yeah, it seems like everybody's kind of stepped away. <laughs> I see Cal, anybody, I see Cal Geller here. Karma Doc's here. Heidi, anybody on the stage have a question they want to ask? I know Greg said he did, so. If not. I have a question. Oh, go ahead, Karma Doc. Please. Thanks. Hi, Jason. How are you? I'm good. I, I'm glad to know you're doing better. I know you went through a dark time recently. Yeah, thanks so much. It's been nice to have everybody's support. Um, along those lines, I've been feeling the need to do an isometric analysis of my life. And I wondered if you thought the... Um, you were doing a, an analysis with pi and phi and other mathematical constants. Did you find... When you use those, whether it you know it was a similar events, would that be sort of on a negative slant, a positive slant? If you could kind of tell me the gist of uh, you know what I might find with those and which ones I should focus on. 
Um, before you do any type of mathematical analysis of your life, karma, you need to, uh, you need to provide yourself a list. Just had all these lights go out, guys. One stayed okay. on. I don't know what happened here. Wow, hold on. Let me turn these back on. So, I just heard. I just heard the generator. I just heard the generator come on. All the other lights came went off. Well, they say you're right. on the net, so that's good. Oh yeah, I'm on my laptop, so it's 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 got charge. Yeah, you need a you need a you need a list, Karma Doc. The exact dates of very prominent things that you have experienced in your life. You know, that's the only way you're ever going to be able to do a mathematical analysis of your life. You're going to know, have to know those dates. You have to, uh, if you have any kids, you want to know the dates that they were, that they were born. Uh, uh, significant events in their life. Um, when you got a job that you wanted. When you lost a job that you wanted. When you, when you had achieved something that you, a goal. When you had met a goal. When you had made a goal. Oh, uh, come again? No, keep going, Jason. You're good. Oh. Uh, just feedback. Yeah, oh, you need a you need a list first of all those dates before you would ever be able to find cycles and epicycles, isometric patterning, these things that are in all of our lives. We all have these patterns, and those patterns have predictive value. They actually show us different times in the future when nature is moving with us as opposed to the construct being restrictive. That's the value of doing this type of analysis on your life. It's a I'll give you I'll give you an example. If you were to find if you were to look at 17 or 18 different events in your life and you and and with a calculator you you are automatically all off the rip found several cycles. Well, you could use those cycles and look at the dates in the future and some of those independent cycles will merge at certain these are nexus points in your future. Those are the date. Those are the dates when that's the greatest days for you to act, for you to actually do something that will that will perpetuate more whatever it was it was connected to it in the construct. And so uh, I live my life by this as well. There are some times when it's time to attack. There are other times when I need to be on standby. There are other times when I not, I, I don't need to be in war battle mode. And there, there are some times when I need to be exhibiting as much love as possible. This That's how I live my life, man. I, I'm analyzing every single day of my life. And anybody can, but you got to start recording the dates that you experience certain events. Because this is a mathematical construct. And being a construct, it means it has predictive value. There is no such there is no such thing as chaos. Chaos is merely laws that are unrecognized. The more you analyze chaos, the more you realize these are other patterns that you didn't have notice of, you didn't have a, a prior knowledge of. But once you start once you start realizing that the events of your life are structured and that because you're not paying attention, you actually miss out on favorable days to act. That uh um uh, the more you do this type of analysis, you're just going to see it's going to be so blatant to you. You're going to be exploding with excitement trying to show other people and tell other people. I've done so many charts on my life, forward and backward. It's a, it's, it's, it, you get bored with it. You get bored with it after a while, but still, it's a, it's a beautiful phenomenon to, to, to be able to show on paper these, these, these epic cycles that govern our life. And it's awesome to look back on your past and see these isometric projections and these loops like, wow, that's why that happened. I, that's, that's the trajectory that I was on. Now, on a piece of paper, we're only looking at a two dimensional deal, but it's a, this is the type. This is the type of research that, that I had spent years doing in prison with a calculator. I mean, I, I had done it to the point where, I, I guess I don't have it in here right now. wish I did. I'd show it to you. Oh, yeah, I don't have it right here. Got a whole bunch of stuff in here, but I don't have it. Oh, this type of research is, 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 is very interesting, but it's, uh, it's, all, it's also... It's very time consuming. So you, you need to go through your files. You need to, you need to, that's the best way to do it. You've got to have the exact dates. And once you have those and you're able to look at them, you can put them on a Microsoft Word document. And the first thing you'll want to do is know exactly how many days and how many months are in between each event. Then you need to isolate which events are very similar in nature because those are all a part of the same reality tunnels. Uh, you know, bad, bad hair days, bad day, bad days, car wreck days, uh, um, uh, a 
an accident, a, a loss of something, you know, a, a separation. I mean, you you suffered loss recently. So these are things that are all part of the same reality tunnels. They affect you negatively. They're a part of the same mathematical structure. So I would have to actually sit down and do a lesson. And one, one of these days, somebody somebody had, had asked me about it. One of these days, I, I may do. I may do something where we rent a space somewhere and do a workshop and just show about 15, 20 people in the workshop and just spend three days doing this type of material. I'm going to show you because what I wanted to show you was a thumb drive that has a keypad on it because I've been doing this for a long time and the structuring of reality is purely mathematical. And this this research is is on my thumb drive, and I have it. And I don't know where it is right now. I just had it either on that table because it's not in here, but it stays on me everywhere I go. And it's uh, it's it's you you can Google them. They got anybody can buy them. They're just real expensive. Uh, mine was real expensive, but it's got a keypad on the thumb drive. It's a thumb drive just like this. It's a thumb drive just like this, except it's a little longer, and it's got it's got ten of. Here's one right here. I'm about to I'm about to upload. Here's one right here. I'm about to upload. I'm about to fill this up. Yeah, I keep that's an actual key, key, keypad. If you don't have the right pin, you, you can't open the data. And if you try three times, it's wrong. It just completely burns out the data. This right here, oh, self destructs. Yeah, you don't have to worry about anybody stealing your data. Nobody's going to steal your, your thumb drive and then put it in their computer because they're not going to be able to use it. Well, I think a workshop like that would be really, really useful and, you know, sort of train the trainers and then, then everybody could go out and do other workshops. And I just had a quick other thing. Um, I, I do have all that medical data on 1901, 1902, so I'll email that to you. But then you're okay with Brian Forrester still, right? I like Brian Forster. I have two of his books in my library. Okay. I, I'll, uh, I'll email you, but um, if you guys wanted to do that Egypt trip at the end of February. Oh, I'm not, I'm not leaving Texas, but I mean, I'm not leaving the United States, but I would no. definitely, I would definitely have Brian Forster on my channel. I would definitely have a chat with him. Oh, uh, well, uh, yeah, I've got nothing. I, I've already exhibited. I have one video that shows I did a book review of his and I showed almost every picture in one of his books on South America, on the technolithic artifacts, the, the laser precision stonework that's found in South America. That's a Brian Forrester book. Uh, yeah, I did that about two years ago. It's on my channel. But I like Brian Forrester. I just haven't had, had, had any time really to reach out to him. But if you know him and you can set it up, if you can set it up, Brian Forrester is more than welcome to come chat all day long on, on, on my channel. I'll, uh, I'll contact him. Awesome. Nice to speak with you. Appreciate it, Comic Doc. Uh, Greg, is your... let's try this again. You hear me? There you go. Got gotcha. you. Great. Have it. Good. Hey, Jason, I've been doing some reading on the uh, American Indian uh, native folklore, myths, and legends, and I sent you an email earlier talking about it. But have you looked in and uh, done a comparison? What I find is a comparison of the. Uh, uh, floods and also the Immaculate Conception, and that is spoken in the American uh, Native Indians uh, legend, uh, more specifically the Yavapai and the Mojave Apaches. You're talking about the Immaculate con Conception is mentioned in Native American traditions? Yes, that's correct. What I find, I found, I've got several books that I've read and, and rereading re one of them right now, but most of them are written by the white devil, you know, but, and there's a, a couple of them by the Indians, but, uh, uh, they talk about the, uh, the flood coming up from beneath the surface of the earth after the flood. And then, uh, also, uh, you know, putting a, a single female in a tree trunk canoe and putting her afloat and told with instructions not to leave the canoe until she could put her feet on dry ground. She did so, went to the mountains, laid down, and the waters impregnated her, giving her a daughter who was impregnated the same way. That's the uh, Mojave and the Yavapai legends. 
Yeah, that's a that's a similar. I mean, it's similar to the birth of Sargon of Akkad. Yeah, Sargon yeah. Sargon of Akkad was born of an Enitu priestess who had never known a man, and uh, this is what he claimed as well. He was born on the waters and uh, put in a reed basket, just like just like four hundred years later they said Moses was. So uh, I don't know. Uh, what I need to do is I have I have a whole collection of books that were written in the 1860s, 70s, and 80s by authors who were interviewing Indians back back then and writing whole books. This library here, I have several books on Native American traditions, legends, and lore. And I'm going to tell you now, anybody, even Native Americans today, who are who are Basically, writing these histories, and you know, there's there, there's a few there's a few guys of of Na Native American heritage that are putting out books today. Listen, they don't have access to any other data that we don't have access to, because all this stuff was recorded in the 1700s and the 1800s, and since then, no one's really been passing any of this down orally. Oral tradition is almost dead. It's almost dead. Everything is is down to the written word, and I would I would be less like Frank Waters wrote a good book, the Book of the Hopi is really good, but there's better ones than that. You know, you got to go to the older material. Like, like I said, real soon, uh, John's already on it, but this real soon we're gonna have PDFs of everything in this library you see behind me, free. We're not selling them. We're gonna give them free to the entire Archaics family, and a lot of these books cover Native American materials. And some of it's just, it'll blow your mind what these people remember. Wars, wars against the giants. There, there are so many Native American traditions that talk about uh, great, tall, white people were here in North America uh, before the coming of their father's fathers. And that when they had, when they had moved into the land following the elk, they had, they had come across these cities of, of, of white people. They had called them ghosts and pale, they call them pale ones. You know, it's amazing some of the things that were, that were recorded, especially, uh, especially when we find that not only did they have these traditions, but they even convey certain colloquials, phrases, words that were known only to the Welsh. And they're describing Welsh people in, you know, uh, up in New England area. These are, these are Native American traditions about a whole like subculture of white people just stuck there in North America for a couple of hundred years, and they basically left everybody alone. And they got real populous until there was a huge Indian war. Several tribes came together and wiped those people out. But at the exact same time, the historical record does record that a Welsh prince did take a bunch of people from Wales. And they got on boats and they ended up lost somewhere in North America and never heard from again. Which is, which is confirmed in the 1830s, 1840s, and 1850s by all these scholars who went in and talked to all these Native American tribesmen. And they got the story and the words that were remembered about certain things by, 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 the, by, the, by the Indians are all Welsh words. It's really interesting. It's, it's the Native American histories are, are 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 fascinating because it's not just Native Americans and it's not just it's not just Welshmen that came over here. It's not just Vikings. I mean, you know, you uh, you know, in 1354, King Magnus sent uh, a ship over here full of Goths to survey North America, and they got attacked by Indians, and they left the Kensington Rune Stone. They left the whole story, and they were panicking. They said they were going back to the shore because they just got attacked by, they lost 10 men, uh, and uh, that's too many. They lost 10 men to violence, had to bury them, so they write the Kensington Rune Stone, and they say they still got another three-day journey to get back to the ships where they left 10 other guys, and they were scared those other guys were going to be dead. So uh, uh, there are several references to fair-skinned, red-headed uh, people in the land that I find in some of this these old books. North America has a very, very complex history. There was also there was also normal humans with red hair and green and blue eyes, but they had six toes on their feet and six fingers on their hands, and they were found all over, like uh, Lovelock. Uh, Lo uh, what was that Lovelock Cave? Uh, the Smithsonian Institute did a great job of rounding up a bunch of those specimens, and uh, I, I even have it in one of my videos where I where, I, where I'm explaining in 2003 how an archaeological 
uh, excavation was going on in either Arizona or Nevada where they found about 20 skeletons and they found textiles I'm talking about textiles where they were making shirts and making like clothes and stuff where the where the thread count was unbelievable. They had six fingers on each hand, six toes, and the FBI came in and they sh they basically stripped down these college students and these professors took all the artifacts, took everything, and then made every single buddy, single person sign NDEs. I mean NDAs, and then turned around, and left, and took all the artifacts. Shut down the whole archaeological site. This is in 2003. It was recently published in a book in 2006 or seven. And uh, I quoted that in my in my video. But there was a lot a lot going on. We know the Romans were here. We know the Carthaginians are here. We were we we've got Cypriot inscriptions. We've got Libyan inscriptions. All these things. We know ancient Egyptians were in North America. North America has a fascinating history. And it's it's not it's not the watered down version that we read in encyclopedias. Well, one final quick question uh that I have is uh any references to Mount Maru and the uh Hindu versus the uh Buddhist uh beliefs and also the, the recent Swami change from the square earth to the globe. Um, I don't, I don't see a lot of difference between Buddhism and Hinduism. One, one stemmed straight from the other. Yes. Uh, uh so I, I don't really see that. So I don't know. I don't know. And I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, um, I didn't, I didn't catch that second part about a square earth. Yeah. The ancient belief of the Buddhist was that the earth was square. Space was, oh. uh, round, but the earth was square and now the new Swami uh, has flown around the world and and claims it to be a globe oh yeah well you know he uh, it's a uh, that's what the construct does is the stellosphere is specifically designed to deceive you into doing the necessary calculations and if you do those calculations you will conclude that we're on a globe it's designed to do that I've said this on my channel many times. A lot of the flat earthers can't get past that. You can't understand. Listen, we live in a realm. We live in a construct. But the sky is a stellar sphere. It is producing mathematical phenomena for you to see. One of them, the most important, is the fact that the stars do not cross the sky in a straight line. At night, at night they arc. And anybody with a modicum of, of intelligence will realize by observing that, especially with a camera that takes pictures every, every five minutes, you will see that arc. That arc will automatically conclude that, well, if, it, if the stars aren't just moving across the sky, but they're actually arcing, then they must be circling around a center. This gets you to talking, thinking about a pole. So, as soon as you realize, oh, okay, well, the star's telling me that we're going around a pole. So, next, the next thing that would be observed, you can still believe in a flat earth, but it's spinning around a pole now. And this is what the stars show you. This is why they arc. Okay, I understand that now. <laughs> but the stellosphere isn't done with you because the, a reasonably intelligent individual will then look at the two main objects in the sky. Both of them are round. Now, you can't see the sun if, if it's a globe, if it's globular or spherical. You can't. It's just a disk. It's bright. It's huge. So, but the moon you can study. And when you study the moon, all the deception is in the, is in the shadows. Because when you study the moon, if the, sun is, if the sun is supposed to be to the east and you're looking at the moon, then that side of the moon will have, will have a crescent. And the size of that crescent will be dependent upon how much of the surface is being hit with sunlight. This is what the sky is promoting. This is what, what people on the surface are led to believe. Well, the moon must be a sphere because I can see the, sh I can see the light reflecting from the sun. It's always coming from the direction of where we think the sun is. So reasonably intelligent person would follow the, this, this, these trajectories of the stars and this light patterning on, on the moon. And you could basically see that the moon does look like a sphere. So you would conclude, and you're not guilty of nothing for doing it because we're reasonably intelligent individuals. You would look at all this and you would conclude, well, damn, 
if the moon is spherical, and it looks like it from all the reflection of the light, I must be on a spherical world too, which would make sense of the stars arcing this way because they're going around a pole, which means there must be another pole down there. Well, just, listen, nobody's guilty of being stupid when the stellar sphere was very cleverly designed to, to perpetuate that deceit. It's all illusory. There's no such thing as pole shifts and lithospheric displacement and all that, but that's what we're led to believe. We're led to believe in all this destruction. When all this destruction happens down here, we see this whole stellar sphere move. In ancient times, they saw the sun just go, followed by the moon. Then the daylight would disappear, and then the nighttime would come, and then there's all the stars, and it happened in three or four minutes. Then it was followed by earthquakes, volcanic explosions that could be heard for thousands of miles. Then it was all washed away in tsunamis, and then humanity started over all over again. This has happened a few times. So, no one's guilty of being stupid when this construct is specifically designed to make you believe that, to make you come to that conclusion, because it's trying to convince you that you're in a real reality when you're not. So, I don't ever really get on my Flat Earth brothers about, about it. I don't really don't care. Like I said, I believe Flat Earth is a stepping stone to a much deeper understanding of our reality. Well, Jason, thank you for taking all my questions. I'd like to invite you to catch me on here one day as a 40-year airline pilot. Uh, why I believe in the simulation versus the globe or the Flat Earth. So, thank you. Good. I, I believe I just recently made you a moderator, didn't I? Yes, you did. Thank you. Okay, that's you, that's you then. I know who you are, yeah. Appreciate it, Greg. Great question, man. Um, free world. I think you were next. I'm going to go with that way. You got a question for Jason? Yeah. Hey, Jason. Uh, my name is Michael. I, I met you at the Ash Asheville event. How you doing? Uh, pretty good yourself. Pretty good. Um, I have a question about um, Spider Grandmother and uh, Shiva. Are are they in any way related, and are they figures during the vapor canopy world? Okay, they are. So, for a, for a period of time, uh, Professor Lydell is one of the best sources for this material. He put out books in the 40s and 50s. They are unmatched. No one has, has broke down the ancient world of Sumer, Akkad, and Babylon, and ancient Egypt better than Professor Lydell. I have a video about him. I, I, I talk about how he broke down Manish Tusu and who he was and who he is in the Book of Jasher, who he was, means uh, of ancient Egypt, Scorpion King. Listen, Professor Lydell is my source, and I'm going to do future videos about him too because it's just mind-blowing what this man has uncovered. Archaeological proof of who is who in the ancient world. So, there was a patriarchal takeover of ancient Egypt, and they took the arachnid symbol, which was a, which a vapor canopy, uh, it's a vapor canopy uh, uh, symbol for the old matriarchy that was ruling during the vapor canopy period, from which the Sumerian king list came. The seven kings of Sumer were not authoritarian. The seven kings of Sumer were extensions of the power of a matriarch. The seven kings were actually eight rulers. This is what we find in the Sumerian and Babylonian texts. This is what we find in the book of Revelation, which says that, you know, in the last days, the last days are going to be like the days of Noah. Well, in the days of Noah, there was a matriarchal power ruling, but there were males that were sitting on the thrones, but they answered to a, a goddess, a matriarch. This is the vapor canopy period. This is where the arachnid symbol came from. It wasn't, it wasn't regarded as an evil symbol. In ancient Egypt, that ruler, that dynasty, was known as Scorpion King. But in ancient Americas, they maintained the, the, the matriarchal concept, and they, and they, they turned it into uh, Grandmother Spider, or Spider Grandmother. But, uh, on the, like I said, on the Sumerian king list, it was the seven kings who were allied to the eighth, and the eighth was a female, a Lulu. So, uh, there's another reference. Oh, Kali, yes, the eight arms of Kali. 
A lot of oh, a lot of people think that Shiva and Kali, when they're represented as at eight arms, is always evil, and it wasn't. It wasn't. A lot of people who practice in Hindu Hinduism today will tell you that this was a genetrix. This was a creator. This was somebody who was a benefactor to mankind, and the goddess was represented with eight arms, and only as the destroyer later represented was was she Shiva, but or other or other manifestations and avatars. Because the Hindus talked about avatars as well. But this concept of an eight-armed individual is ancient. Like Scorpion King, so that the kings of the Sumerian kings, uh, Shiva, Spider Graham. These are all references to the vapor canopy period. And they're all references to the matriarchy that was ruling at that time before the collapse of the vapor canopy. When the vapor canopy magnified the moon to an extraordinary size. When the vapor canopy collapsed, it looked like the moon lost its power. Now it was far away. The magnification effect of the mesosphere was no longer working. The sun had appeared and the sun was taken as a patriarchal symbol and this is how the matriarchy lost its power. And this is why some of the eight-armed figures later had become had become males like Scorpion King because it was a memory of the vapor canopy period but it was a memory now from a later patriarchal uh, dynasty. Are, are there any, I'm sorry if I can ask one more question on that same line, are, are there any references that you've run across about the loss of magnification of the stars? There is. There are some authors that have noticed that it's very peculiar that the seven sisters, known as the seven Pleiades or Pleiades, how you ever say it, uh, you, you can only see six of them with the naked eye, but in the ancient traditions, oral traditions, there was all they were always numbered to seven. So uh, I, I've read some pretty good material from like Ivar Zapp in the 1950s and 60s, where there's different stars that are very prominent in the sky through telescopes, but the ancients knew about them and mentioned them. Therefore, the magnification of the heavens must have been something that we took for granted at one time. And with the collapse of the vapor canopy, the stars seem to have disappeared, which is, a, which is also attached to North American, Native American traditions. There are many, many, many Native American traditions that claim, especially in the Algonquin uh, branch, there, these traditions say that at one time the stars were so close we could talk to them. The stars were so close we could touch them, and the stars were so close that we could hear their singing. And then something happened in the age of the stone giants, and the stars receded. For safety, they got away. This, th these are traditions that tell me that the vapor canopy collapsed, which is nothing but a giant magnificate magnifier at night. And when that when when that when that cataclysm occurred, the survivors knew the stories. They knew what they saw before the cataclysm, but their children didn't know what they saw. So these things were recorded in oral traditions, as like fairy tales and myths and, le and, and legends. Because all it takes is one generation to absolutely lose lose historical context. You had mentioned Sirius B before. Isn't that one that you that we didn't see until the seventies with a telescope? Yeah. So you can't see Sirius B or C with the naked eye. I appreciate it. it. Thank you, Jason. Yeah, man. Appreciate you, brother. Great questions. Um, Aaron Protocol, you got a question, sir? Saw you on mute. I can't hear you, brother. Where are you, Aaron? Now you're muted again. I see Adam's okay. I was wondering with all that stuff going on in Morocco. Yeah, brother, we can't hear you. Go. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Say something. No, that was me, not him. Oh, that was you. Okay. Phoenix, go ahead. Well, let's see if he can't fix his audio. But uh, Phoenix Lorales, if you want to ask a question, you are muted too. There you go. Where are you, Lorelius? Yeah, not hearing you either. I guess we're having mic issues today, huh?
Yeah, let's move on to Garrett. Into the next episode. Go ahead, Garrett. Alright, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we got you, brother. Go ahead. Hey, how you guys doing tonight? How you doing, Jason? I'm good, man. You? Good. I've uh, I've been following your stuff for a long time now, so it's been uh, it's been great, and uh, appreciate you actually all the work you've done and uh, getting on these these uh, this Discord platform. It's awesome to be able to actually communicate with you like this. So, awesome. Uh, yes. So my question is, and this is one thing I want to just you know say thanks for is. You help me to avoid a lot of costs to avoid authors that have a lot of information, like uh, Anatoly Fomenko, and that would actually brings me to my question. And I know you've you've answered or you've uh, addressed this in one of your videos, or maybe several of them, but it's hard to go through and sift and find those videos. But with Fomenko's information, what would you say are the biggest holes and discrepancies found in his information? Well, first of all. When it comes when it comes to Fomenko, he brought to the table a accusation that is so incredible that it would require an equally incredible amount of evidence to 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 show. And so when I'm going through this material, I'm like, damn, I got PDFs of all Fomenko's material. So I'm like, damn, I'm going through all this, like, wow, this this sounds good, but. We have the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles, and they go back a long time. And we got the Frankish Annals; they go back a long time. We have all the chi we have the Chinese records and histories, and we know they've been destroyed and rewritten. It, but how are you going to how are you going to claim a millennium of time was invented? And it's it's it 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 shocks me that. The arguments were so weak, and it's not. I mean, like I said, it sounds good, but we have the Phoenix phenomenon every 138 years. So he he didn't know about that. He had he. There's not a hint of his material that even infers that he knew about this cycle. And yet, I'm telling you right now that what we know of from the ancient world, ha we're still on the 138 year cycle because in 1764 we have all that phoenix data with astronomer hoffman and millions of europeans seeing the object in the sky in the month of may 1764 and 138 years later we got 1902 and all the phenomena that happened in 1902 so if there's missing centuries then that means the entire world was involved sometime in the past in scrubbing all the histories and rewriting them to hide this at the same time that they made sure to stay perfectly even with the 138 year phenomenon meaning there couldn't be a there couldn't be a one there could not be a thousand years missing the, you know what don if you're listening i'm going to need my my charger for the laptop i'm down to i'm down to 10% i don't know if she's listening so because you can account for 138-year Phoenix phenomenon events that occurred, there's, there's holes right there in, in Fomenko's information. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, well, first of all, the burden of proof lies on Fomenko. You understand? Yeah. The burden of proof doesn't lie on, lie on me to disprove him, but there's so much information that I have, such as the 1,872,000 days of the Mayan long count being divided by 144,000 days divided by 13 Bactons. Thank you. It says, listen, the, we, have Mayan, we have Mayan steels dated from 31 BC all the way up to the 6th century AD. Those Mayan steels record the Bactan counts. We have the Venus Almanacs. The, the Maya, the Mayan Venus almanacs have thousands of calculations of the positions of Venus going back over over centuries and centuries of time. So, how does Fomenko get around all that? Were the Maya were the Maya involved in this as well? They artificially create all these dates on, on their on their date steels because every year the Maya erected a new steel. The new steel had the sigils of the stargazers that were that were doing that, uh, that were doing the calculations that year. And they said what Bactin it was, what Catan it was, what Unal it was. They were very very meticulous. It, the Mayan long count is almost like computer precise. So 
Domenko has a lot of, of things to dismantle before he can construct that type of theory. But one thing that stands in his way, one thing that really stands in his way, is that 138-year periodicity of the Phoenix. Because it happened in 1902, it happened in 1764. Now, I'm willing to say that we have missing history. Because I agree with that. I agree that history's been, been scrubbed. Bolsheviks did a good job of that, too. Rewriting history books, totally eliminating whole, whole cultures. I'm, all, I'm on board with that. But I'm not on board with missing years. Because... That would completely upset so much of the chronological data, and yet I've shown the, the patterns. There is no way that I have been able to document over 300 isometric projections in four or five chapters of my published books and shown on YouTube all these meticulous chronological patterns and deals that remain true. Amazing things if there was any missing time. If there was missing time, none of that, none of that stuff could have been shown. Yeah, too many coincidences exhibits no coincidence at all. I need to plug this up before you can't. You guys can't hear me anymore. We'll find I appreciate that. Up. That makes sense. You know what? I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna look in more. I'm gonna look more into Fomenko to see how he made that mistake. I'm not. I'm not just gonna totally ignore his material. I got all his PDFs. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go into it more. I just need a little time. I had just purchased one of his books, then came across your information, and then I didn't have to worry about getting his other books after that. So, thanks yeah, again. Yeah, they're expensive, but all, there's also PDFs out, out there for them. Oh, nice. You good, man? You got one more question or try to one or two? You good? I'm good for now. I might have a few more later if, if no one else has any. Right. I still got questions written down. I got to get to too, but trying to get people up here on to to ask their questions. You know, go ahead, Aaron. You got that working now? You just muted yourself. Phoenix Laurelius, you ready? All right. Hey, hey. Do you hear me now? Yeah, I got you, brother. Go ahead. Hey, 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 Jason, my brother from another mother. I just got a quick, a quick, <laughs> quick question. <laughs> Now, you stated back in a, one of the videos, I think it was Laughing at the Dark, and you were talking about the rabbis after the Baraka Rebellion specifically changed the Hebrew calendar dating because they did not want the Christians to use the mathematical prophecies. What book or what source was that where you got that information so I could do that verification for my little wife, who is very... Pro Hebrew. Does it? Does anybody recall? I just I just quoted that source recently, and it's from a a, a free it's from a Freemason encyclopedia. Uh, I just did it somewhere recently on a video because it, it happened to whatever whatever recent video I just did where I was outlining and breaking down the whole Bar Kokhba rebellion. Oh, I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's on Archaix TV. I, I can't. I can't do archaics TV. I don't have. Hey, I'll get the. I will get the information. I'll say I'll get that citation for you because I mentioned it on archaics TV okay. in a video about why the Romans had attacked Jerusalem twice in 70 A.D. and then they went back in 135 A.D. and did it again. But this time they raised it to the ground. They salted the fields and they sold like 55,000 Jews into slavery, and the rest of them went to different countries. So. In that video, in that video, I cited the source where that came from, where those rabbis admit to changing the Hebrew calendar so that the world would believe that we were at this certain year, which is today's Jewish year, that's widely published, which is untrue. It's totally untrue. It's totally untrue. It's 134 years off. And if you were to factor those 134 years that they took away from that calendar, you will find that we are exactly where I tell you we are. It is the it is the Annus Mundi year right now fifty what is it fifty nine sixteen fifty nine seventeen so we're at fifty nine seventeen right now and Anno Mundi fifty nine seventeen that so they they backdated it one hundred and thirty four years yep one hundred and thirty four yep. years okay all right so now I do appreciate that yeah I don't I can't access the RKX TV so I get uh, with me Aaron and I'll help you with that. Okay, all right. Well, I got one more question, if you don't mind. 
Go for it. Now, I understand and I see in you, I have watched you since you were feeding chickens on the videos. <laughs> I mean, I've been watching you. I've watched, I've watched every one of your videos. I've watched all of them. I've reviewed your material. I've been living your material. So awesome. I, can awesome. tell, I, I can testify that indeed retro causality works 100%. So if the question is, as you stated once, you said nothing external to your informed field can ever change the fundaments of your life. Only you can. Now, I right. understand that. Here's my question. How do you keep your mind in that focus? How do you keep your mind? How do you, as an individual, errant, extraordinaire, how do you keep your mind it will not allow you to get caught back into that dungeon programming. Okay, well, that's a really good question, but it's weighted with a false assumption. Because I'm going to tell you now, I'm going to tell you now, it's a daily basis. Even for myself, it's a daily basis, it's a daily struggle. I'm hyper-focused because I'm a man on a mission. And that helps me because I'm always interested in putting things together. I never really know week to week which videos I, I, I want to release, but I literally have hundreds I could do. I have so much material, but it's uh, that focus helps me. But I'm going to tell you now, I, I slide back. I slide back a little bit on a daily basis, and I catch myself because we live, we live in an observer-dependent basically construct and this construct is always throwing out these little traps it's always throwing these little traps out trying to get you to go down a different reality tunnel trying to get you to do something that's distracting you from your main course of action uh, a perfect a perfect case in point a perfect case in point this book that just got published was specifically designed to do exactly what it did promote controversy there's no way that this guy actually thought I was going to bite. I was going to actually go with this book. And there's no way he actually thought that I was going to succumb to flattery as well. When the, listen, when these types of people are on the attack, when they're trying to do stuff like hijack narratives and all that, they've already got, got several variables to work with because a think tank has already come out and spit these out for them. Yeah, this is far more far more to this whole situation than you think. I said, but I'm not biting. I don't care. I'm going to ignore this. What, what, what these people want is for me to get drawn into a controversy where I am locked, locking my horns with this insignificant personality who just appeared out of thin air a year ago espousing all my stuff. So I'm going to ignore him. I got the emails. I got everything I need. This is nothing but a distraction. The same distractions are thrown out before you and before every everybody listening to my voice right now. You need to learn. You need to learn to recognize when these distractions are being laid before you, because they would not be laid before you if you weren't over the target. Whatever you're trying to do in your personal life, you're real close to getting there. If all of a sudden you meet with a bunch of resistance. That resistance is there for a reason. It's because you're getting close. So, yeah, you got to learn to you got you got to learn to read these things. You've heard the expression "read the room." Yeah, it's real easy. It's real easy to get to get to get trapped into all these things in the world because that's what the world is. It's a it's a giant trap. It's, so you got to you got to recognize when somebody or a phenomena is trying to play you. Whether it's real or imagined, uh, an NPC or or an actual person, so or or a group working behind the scenes, all supporting one individual who's messing with you, it doesn't matter. Recognize the traps and navigate them. That's it. It's it's a matter so basically it's staying on top of your staying on top of your focus all the time, and even when you slip, getting it back, get back to where you were, get your thoughts back to where they were and then continue to go forward. And just so you know, mm -hmm. I say it, simulacrum, 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 simulacrum. <laughs> yeah, I'm in. That's how I well, say listen. it, and I do appreciate you. Let that energy work for you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I, I want to I simplify. Before you go, I'll simplify this real quick. In order to maintain your focus, 
you have to have a goal. If you wake up in the morning, if you wake up in the morning as a blank slate, not knowing what you want to do that day, I promise you, you're not going to get anything done that day. You're going to go in multiple different directions, and by three o'clock in the afternoon, you're going to realize, shit, I haven't done a damn thing today. Yeah, wake up in the morning with just one goal. If you start getting good at life, two or three goals, whatever. But but if you have a goal then it's easy to maintain a focus. If you don't have a goal, if it's a big goal or a medium goal or a big goal, uh, if it's a long-term goal, whatever, as long as you have something that you're looking at at the distance, then anything that comes up in your periphery can easily be ignored. Much love, brother, much love. All right, right. Great, great question, man. That was awesome. Um, Phoenix, did you get your six? If you did, I still can't hear you. Ugh. All right. Uh, I think Lady M was next on here. You got something? Go ahead. You're muted. Hi, Jason. How you doing? Hello? Hey, uh, great to be um, with you. Um, I have a question regarding um, how to teach the next generation. That's what I'm struggling with right now because I'm coming into contact with this information myself for the first time, your research, and I find it fascinating, but I'm struggling with how to direct the next generation so on uh as to you know every textbook i have right now teaches of this history the main mainstream history that is that was taught to me which is contradicting to your research and i don't know how to pass down this information to my children um, in a way that would benefit them. And I'm wondering if you have any advice on where to begin, uh, what books you might advise to start with. Oh, that's a good one. It's because we don't really have, we're not in the position now of really having uh like not not then i understand what you're talking about we we we're, we really we really need like an archaic syllabus that would start at like the third grade level yes. and and go up all the way all the way to collegiate level i'm on board i'm on board with working on a project like that i'm just uh I can't, I'm just one person though. This would require a team of individuals to come together and literally dissect 530 something videos and all my published books. And uh, I think a team of five or six or seven individuals could probably do that pretty fast and co come, come up with a, with a syllabus. But these things, these things ta would, take, would take finances. These things would also take five or six volunteers who could devote full time to that and be able to come together to be able to do it so they could spread all these materials out. If, if there was a group that wanted to do that, I would provide all the materials. I would provide the published books and multiple copies of them. I would provide all the thumb drives that were needed with all the data, and I would provide thumb drives that have all 540-something of my videos. And but this is something that, that someone else is going to have to do. There's no way that I can do it and do what I'm doing right now. I Jason, may I jump in and add something to this? Mm -hmm. This is Greg. Hey, Greg. Uh, Lady M, if you would uh, join us in the voice chat. We have several teachers uh, that uh, teach uh, adolescents and things. They could give you some guidance and insight. Or you have issues, uh, many of us sit here and talk about the problems. We're all on the same frequency. And oh, it's, it's a good place to hang a, out. <laughs> yeah, I've actually been on a voice chat with you guys, I think, once. And, um, you need the thing to do is, it more. Yeah, the thing is, um, 
I was put into this homeschool position as an educator, you know, kind of not unwillingly, but sort of unwillingly, as in I didn't will it into position. And um, I'm here, and I'm high school. I, I'm uh, homeschooling a high school student, and I'm looking at all the textbooks that are available today. Nothing comports with the research that I'm being exposed to, as far as Jason's research. And for me, I find it it's so conflicting um, on a day to day basis just to try to get through the information when I know that may not be true. And uh, as a parent, bring, it is... Bring those issues up in the voice chat. We have many people with lots or vast resources, as Jason talked about. Uh, you know, I've got a lot. I've been, my, I've been deep diving on the ancient uh, Indian folklore tradition. It really interests me. Uh, anyway, that's my two cents worth. We'll check it out. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah, great question. I would definitely like to dive into that some more. Uh, who we got next? Uh, go ahead, uh, Stem Cell Girl. I think you were the next one up here. And you're muted too. Oh, thank there you, you go. so much. Oh, you got me? Yep. Yep. Thank hey, you. Gotcha. My, name, my name's Simone. <laughs> um, thanks so much for the work, Jason. Um, really appreciate it. I'm actually a, a um, biomedical scientist, so I really understand a lot of stuff that's been spoken here so I appreciate the work um, I listened to the latest uh, video that you did and um, what really sparked my interest is the laws and the contracts um, Australia seems to be getting into that um, a lot of people that lost their license to practice and things like that are just going underground here and and we're actually sort of wanting to learn a little bit about our own rights and things like that I love the uh, where our contract really comes from you know obviously to to play in this realm and um we've agreed to a contract um i'm trying to source that obviously it's in the book of exodus is it just a matter of me just trying to get a hold of the book of exodus or is there a copy of it somewhere that i can easily access that oh you're talking about the the uh the difference between the abrahamic Covenant and the yes. covenant of, Yah of Yahweh in Exodus. Yeah. Yes, please. Yes, please. Okay. Okay. Well, the word contract isn't in the Bible. The, the word contract in, in that sense of, of coming to an agreement like that. But that's exactly what it is. It's we have in the book of Genesis, we have a system. We have a syst We have a system that is laid out. You don't have to accept it, but it's in the book of Genesis where basically God is telling Abraham, look, if you will follow me, if you will obey me, and if you will honor me, I will do this for you and your children and your descendants. So it's laid out very clearly, this is what I want you to do. The perimeter, the perimeters of following, obeying, and honoring, honoring God for Abraham are laid out. And then there's a rewards and punishments. The rewards are this. And these will also extend to your your children, meaning this contractual agreement will be will 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 extend. I'm going to offer the same contract to everybody in your in your bloodline, all your genealogy going all the way, all these mighty nations and empires that you're going to father. Everybody's going to have have to make a decision right here in this contract. Now, the Genesis contract is the only one I I, I honor. It's the only one that I even recognize because I understand that the Book of Exodus was written and composed by something else. The book of Exodus begins something totally different. It's a totally different flavor from Genesis. The book of Exodus introduces a whole new personality who's got a whole different agenda. And he lays his contract out too. And when he, does, when he lays his contract out with Moses, it's got over 900 stipulations. It takes it takes Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy means second law. His contract has so many stipulations and loopholes in it that he had to put out a second 
contract to go with the first one. It's all a trap. Starting from Exodus all the way to Malachi, it is one massive, elaborate trap. You don't have so, to accept it. So, Come again? so the seven so the seven million statues in Australia <laughs> it's just it's just out of control. You know, you walk out of the door and you, it's like you're breaking the law. But it's um it's it's amazing. Like everyone's um, divided over how how this law ever started to begin with, you know, and what who who are we who are we agreeing with, you know? And, and I think it always goes back to what you said originally. If you're struggling with the rules, find out who wrote them. Right. Um. Listen, it's. I know you guys are going through some dark some some dark times too, but you're also not being tortured. You're not being burned at the stake. You're not being listen. And I'm not trying. To, I'm not trying to to minimize your your situation. But what is happening is, is basically world controllers that have been having it their way for a very long period of time are now being confronted with the knowledge that their time is very very short. They signed the wrong they signed the wrong contract. So as they're being escorted to the door, which is going to which is which is going to be terrible for them, we call it the great tribulation. While they're being escorted to the door, the the those who signed the other contract are being awakened and we're seeing things for what they are. And we're not liking it. We don't have a lot of power to change the status quo because that wasn't a part of the contract from the beginning. We were told we would, our eyes would be open and that the scales would be removed for it. But most of the promises for the first contract were immortal. The promises for the second contract that has thousands of stipulations was all material. It all involves the avatar and the avatar's relationship with the material world around it. And th those, those who signed that contract were basically given rulership of the world to do what they wanted to until that program would cease functioning, which we're entering that period now. This is why things aren't making, this is why things aren't making sense since 2020. Yeah, the, they're not making sense because the perimeters of that contract are now losing their power. And those who signed that contract now are now seeing the provincial writing on the wall. So this is a very unstable period to be living in. So we can expect a lot of the things like what is happening to Australia. But another thing, another reason Australia is going through what it's going through is because the people that are in power absolutely know that Australia in the future is going to be prime real estate. It's going to move 30 degrees north. And when it does, it's going to it's going to actually become about three times larger than it is now. It's going to be a continent. It's already a continent, but it's going to be huge. China's going 30 degrees north. Eastern Russia, Siberia is going 30 degrees north. Japan, probably Japan's probably going to be gone. It'll be under the Pacific, but it's going 30 degrees north. Well, not quite. It's going about it's going about 20 degrees north. But just like the Americas are going 30 degrees south. In the in the the epicenter of motion is going to be the Great Pyramid. It's the pivot where everything moves. This thirty degrees. So they've done their homework. They've done their telemetry. They've done their they they've, they've done their simulations, their projections. They absolutely know. They absolutely know that the future, basically paradise of the world, is going to be Australia and all the Pacific, all that land and real estate that's under the water off the coasts of Australia. I don't know if you know this or not, but there's already people buying that real estate. It's underwater. It's under the Pacific, but there, but the, some of that real estate has already been sold, and recently. So it's all. Yeah, I, I noticed there was contracts out. Um, changes the law for you know land that's not even recognised. So we're watching them write different laws and things like that, and just watching what they're doing. And um, yeah, it's 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 um, yeah. I think a lot of people are starting to wake up to it. With they're starting to really show up well, in the uh, government houses and that. I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you now. It's 
Like Arthur Schopenhauer, one of my favorite German philosophers, he, he said it best. He says, we often suffer more out of fear than from the reality. This is the period we're going through now. Every decade of, of world history, there are people who lose out. They die, they exit their avatars, it's tragic stuff. But all in all, things aren't really that bad in the world as far as what we actually suffer. What's really bad is all the news. Everything, all this dungeon programming thrown in our face, all this fear programming, fear, all this stuff that's just saturating us is doing it by design. Because those who signed the other contract they're being escorted to the door very quickly, and they're not going to like what's behind it. And they know this. They know this. I'm of the opinion that they are 100% aware that they have cycled through this construct multiple times. It's what they chose, and they, and they have enjoyed the benefits of being on the top through these simulations to the point to where now... They can't even get back if they wanted to. They're just stuck in the cycle over and over and over and over. Some people have a dark genius for being very evil and always getting away with it. So you have to wonder how many times they've gone through this construct that it's going to keep them here and they'll never get out. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. I just had someone to ask this on this subject real quick. Somebody had asked me, and I figured I'd just throw it in there since we were just talking about it. But uh, as far as that contract goes, do you think they physically signed a contract, or is it more of a spiritual thing? I guess. No, no, that's no. A, con a contract doesn't need doesn't do, even in contract law today. A contract can be legally binding on a verbal agreement as long as both as long as it can be shown in court that both parties totally accepted the terms, understood and comprehended the terms, and made a agreement amongst themselves in front of a witness. In contract law, a verbal agreement is absolutely binding. So, no, no, it doesn't. It doesn't mean signing. That's just a modern. That's just a modern, a, mo a modern way of understanding the co a contract is be is having stipulations laid out and have a, and having a choice. Yeah, a contract always requires choice. The element of choice must be present for a contract. So, so uh, yeah, you can't be forced into it. It's not a contract. That's slavery. Yeah, so, yeah it's all. Uh, oh yeah, I just want to clarify. I remembered that somebody had asked me that uh, the other day. Um, uh, Phoenix, are you working now? Am I working? Can you yeah. hear me? I can hear you. <laughs> okay. Um, Phoenix, Phoenix Loren, before you speak, I want to thank you very much for the meeting of Awaken the Immortal Within. I appreciate that. I am so happy to do it. I'm, I'm just so excited that you gave me the, um, the go ahead on that. and. I rather feel that it's kind of like when you were making the the movie, when you were making the Archaics movie, and you were like, it's coming, guys. Yeah. I promise. It's just a lot more work than I thought it was going to be. And that's exactly yeah. Yeah. the position we find myself in now. Um, it's, it's become this huge deal, right? Because as soon as um, my friends found out I was doing it, it was like the universe conspired or whatever phrase you want to use. And yeah. I had a couple of YouTube channels approach me and say, we want to do the music for it. Oh, we want to do the visuals for it. So now it's this whole thing. Um, so, yeah, you'll get it as soon as it's all perfect. Did she fade out? Or is that me? Uh, no. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, I can now. Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay. Yeah, I was just saying, you'll get it as soon as it's all perfect. Um, but I had two questions. And actually... I think um, one of them was sort of already asked, but I'll, I just wanted to clarify. Uh, like, why would the Jews corrupt their own calendar to disprove? Because I think it was Daniel prophecies, right? Um, why would they corrupt their own calendar to disprove the Daniel prophecies if Jesus never existed anyway? I can barely hear y'all. Hold on. Can you hear me right now? I think my, my signal's going down real low. I can hear you. Yeah. Hey, can Phoenix, you hear you? We're, okay. we're trying to keep it in YouTube. For me. 
Yeah, I keep trying to. Oh, did like you hear a question, Jason? Yes. The uh, okay, 135 years is a very long period of time. It's it's not it's not a short period of time. The uh, uh, the change that 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 is mentioned in the Encyclopedia of Encyclopedia of Freemasonry that the change that the Jews made in their own calendar was because the early church fathers. Oh, within 90 years after the crucifixion event, whether it happened or not, they were already trying to use the book of the mathematics, the, the calendar codes that are found in the book of Daniel. That's what caused it. The rabbis did not like the fact that a Jewish text being used to support that Apollonius of Tyana, or were you call him Jesus of Christ, whatever, that this man was the promised Messiah. They didn't like that at all. What they wanted everybody to leave was that Simon Bar Kokhba was the Messiah. So they changed the calendar by 134 years to make it look like the 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 calendar, uh, uh, the 1,260 days and the 1,335 days. All these little all these countdowns that are found in the Book of Daniel that they would line up to Simon of Bar Kokhba and not to Apollonius of Tyana. This is what they wanted to do. They wanted to take away all focus that any of the Christians could use that document because they wanted to show that Daniel was prophesying. Of uh. The future Messiah being Simon Bar Kokhba and not anybody who lived earlier in over a century after the alleged crucifixion. It's 102 years after the alleged crucifixion. So, uh, yeah, there was plenty of time already. The, the, the early church fathers were, were trying to build the whole the whole gospel narrative. Now you understand when this happened, the gospels had not yet come out. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John had not yet surfaced. They did not yet exist when the Bar Kokhba rebellion occurred. They they came onto the scene right after Jerusalem was burned to the ground in 135 A.D. Awesome. Thank you so much. And um, I have just one more question, if that's okay. Sure. Go ahead. Okay, so some esoteric teachers, I and mean, you were talking earlier about the moon and the matriarchal matriarchal. Uh, people that, that worship the moon. And I've heard some other esoteric teachers say that it was actually Venus and not the moon. Is that just a traditional difference, or have you heard anything about that, and what would be your thoughts? Oh, I'm, I, I, I'm, I've read many books that try to give a lot, a lot of attention to detail and focus on Venus, but then again, none of these authors have done deep researches on history to even learn about the vapor canopy period and when, when the moon was the most prominent object in the sky, when the moon literally filled the sky because the mesosphere magnified it. So not having that element of history, not understanding the pre, you know, the antediluvian pre-flood world, not understanding what the ancients were talking about when, when they could literally touch the moon and when they could hear the the stars singing. Yeah, this is a not knowing all this history is why so many later historians focused on Venus, like the Maya focused on Venus, because the Maya didn't have any records of the vapor canopy. They didn't know. And a lot of cultures didn't know. Too many thousands of years had passed. So this is a this is the value we get from people like Hans Bo Hor Horberger and you guys know I'm a fan of Hans Bellamy and Emmanuel Velikovsky. It's these type of researchers that show us that these these most ancient oral traditions were telling us about a, a very a world very different than our own. It was only after the fall of the vapor canopy that the night sky produced another bright object, and that was Venus. And then after and Venus was a wanderer, so they paid attention to it. But there was another bright star that they paid attention to too, but it didn't move, so it wasn't very important. And it was serious. So, uh, I hope that answers your. I hope that answers your question. It's a the majority of any historical writings today don't cover the vapor canopy period, and this is why we have so many weird theories about the ancient past that do not comport at all with what we find in archaeology, like the Akambaro discovery of thirty-five thousand 
or, or figurines showing humans and giant reptiles and giant lizards all, all working together, you know, using them as social creatures and all that. This is vapor canopy period. Like the Ubaid statues that show humans with slits for eyes, like reptilian and stuff. This is all this is all vapor canopy period period of stuff. Just like all the megafauna. We've been lied to and told all this Ice Age crap and all this BS and come to find out that the ad the anatomy of the woolly, woolly rhinoceros, the anatomy of the giant tree sloth, the anatomy of the saber-toothed tiger, the anatomy of the, of the great woolly mammoths, none of those creatures lived in a cold climate. They all lived in a temperate to tropical climate and that hair was designed to cool them by trapping moisture in sweat glands. Everything we've been told is a lie about that period of history. These were vapor canopy creatures. That's why they grew to the sizes they grew to. And when the vapor canopy collapsed, that's why we found whole islands of these creatures all melted together. They died all at the same time. And those, and those at the far extreme, extreme oh, those furthest away from the equatorial zone, what did they do? They froze to death where they stood with tulips still undigested on their tongues. Yeah, 2.5 million woolly mammoths are, are now estimated to be in the permafrost stretching from Siberia, Canada, and Alaska. So, yeah, it's uh, everything we've been told. Absolute lie. The whole, the whole history. So, I'm not surprised by many modern authors just not knowing these things. They don't know them because they, they haven't done the penetrating research because they didn't know that there was things to be found. Thank you so much, Jason. You the man. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, yeah, great question, Pinks. Thank you. Um, Sandy Knight, you are the next one on the Price is Right. Come on down. <laughs> May he rest in peace. <laughs> right. <laughs> For like the fifth time. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Jason, got new how are now. you? Pretty good. Pretty good. <laughs> um, I am so excited that I came across your channel. I'm a teacher and so much of what uh, you have like put together, like the, it's just put the last little like bit on top of, it's like the cherry on top of all of the historical stuff that I put together in like the last 25 years. It's amazing. I mean, my, my brain, my consciousness has expanded like beyond anything that I ever thought was possible. Um, but I have, I have a couple questions, and um, for Lady M, because I'm a teacher, and I've been doing this where I've exposed students to different types of information. If she's teaching her own um, child, she said high school level. So whatever the history is that is being taught, you teach that, but then you do the questioning, right? You, 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 you help them uh, fill in all the holes because there's right. so much, there's so many holes in the history. And then, and then it's like, okay, but like, did this really happen? Is this the exact time period that this really occurred? What is the motive behind this? Like say the history of world war two, right? Who really won that? Right. So, and it's like looking at everything almost opposite of what we've been told. That's like the starting point, And then you go from there. So that that's for her, right? The uh, the Socratic method is always very very powerful. It's cogent because the Socratic method actually allows the the learner to put these things together before they're actually told. Um, right. The asking the asking the right questions rather than asserting facts, because asking questions gets that cognition going, and they're mm -hmm. already they're already trying to figure out how to build pieces <laughs> together and. When somebody comes up with a concept or an idea on their own and they're not told what it is, then it burns in their memory. It's something that they possess. They earn that. It's theirs. So, so Socratic method is very good. But when it comes to educating our, our youth, especially if they're old enough from the junior high level, mid, you know, middle school to high school, college, there's still no better book that I've found that completely crushes the whole scientific narrative better than the book Evolution Cruncher. Evolution Cruncher is fantastic because 
and just scientifically goes through all these dating systems and methods and goes through and shows how they're almost all full of shit. Therefore, <laughs> this, whole, this whole thing that they've, they've been telling us, all this uniformitarianism, evolution, natural, uh, natural selection, every bit of it falls apart. I mean, a lot of people don't even know how to process that whole dinosaur skeletons have been built off a tooth. Hey, this tooth right here, we studied this tooth and we were able to extrapolate. We got all this, and because we know that this species here had this type of jawbone, we can, we, can, we, we can extrapolate. And when you find out that all these things in museums are plaster and they're not bones, and the plaster is designed from molds that were art, artist renditions of scientific descriptions of what a creature could have looked like, it is incredible how the entire history that we've been given just falls mm -hmm. apart on scrutiny. Right. Right. I remember I, I worked at a private Christian school teaching and this was like eight or nine years ago. And one of the questions when I was being, you know, like interviewed was asking, you know, about my like creation belief or whatever. And of course I like quoted, you know, the different verses in Genesis and such. And then at the end of it, because I, I question everything and I'm like, this really doesn't make sense, but here you go. I'm like, but I don't understand where the dinosaurs fit in all of this. Like no. that was what I, that's what I, I, I just put that in there. Cause I was like, it, where, where is it? Like it doesn't. And so that was a long time ago. And then probably in the last, I don't know, six years or something, then it kind of came that the dinosaurs aren't really real. And then you came along and then, you know, so anyway, here's my question. Cause I have been following you and listening and I listen to a new video every single day and it's been going on for probably like a year and a half. So thank you wow. so much again. Um, and so my question is, is cause I am, I don't know how I, or why I'm confused between the Anuna and the sea peoples. Are they the same people or are they two separate or were they one and then they became the other? Okay. I'm going to give it to you as straight as possible. Absolutely straight as possible. Anuna, we have to judge the Anuna by how the Sumerians depicted them. The busts and the statuary that we have from Sumer are easy to find. They don't even hide these things. And they show them as, as alabaster skinned with long beards. And they always, right. have, they always have lapis lazuli for their eyes. So you can't call me a racist if I'm looking at a Sumerian depiction of an Anuna and it shows me a white guy. That's what it shows me. It's a right. white guy. Whiter, whiter than I am. And here it is, these are the Anuna, according to the Sumerians. And the Sumerians were very, very particular in describing themselves as very different. They, they were olive-skinned, with no hair on their bodies, could not grow facial hair, and they had dark eyes and black hair that was long and straight. So, we have the Sumerians priding themselves in Sumerian and Akkadian cuneiform text as the black-headed people. This is what they called themselves, and they did it with pride. They were the black-headed people. And they considered the Anuna as gods. But the Anuna weren't gods. They were just white guys. And they had these pouches, and they had these tablets, and they did amazing things with them. They made, they made things move that shouldn't move. They built things. They built things, and the people, the Sumerians, didn't understand how they could do that. They communicated with devices. The Sumerians, could, the Sumerians couldn't figure out how they did that. They made things appear in the sky and land and take off, and the Sumerians couldn't figure out how they did that. Therefore, ergo, they're gods. Mm -hmm. But they weren't. But they weren't. This was the greatest example of cargo cult that had ever happened. And it, this is the story of the Anunnaki. So the Anuna, the Anuna enter the historical record as Shimsu Hor. They're in the Sumerian Sumer. They're the Anuna and Su, the Sumerians. They're just Anuna. These are the children of An or On. Then we have then we have them entering North Africa as Shimsu Hor. So, they, they're called the Shining Ones, which is not a reference to them being gods. They were considered as gods, but it wasn't. They're shining because most people on the surface of the world had suffered through a cataclysm.
cataclysm and they had lost their infrastructure and they were under a matriarchal totem society and they had built up centuries of melatonin in their skin and they were able to survive on the surface. Not the, not the Anuna. When the Anuna originally arrived, they avoided, they avoided the light of the sky. They were known as night walkers. They were known as night crawlers. They came from the mountains, not the sky. Eric right. Von Daniken, Eric Von Daniken, and Zechariah Sitchin did us a disservice by trying to claim that that, that the Anuna Anunnaki are extraterrestrials and they came here in the ancient past. This whole ancient alien scenario all falls apart upon scrutiny. Even the watchers in the Book of Enoch did not come from the sky. They were called watchers because Asiatic peoples always look at Westerners, Caucasians with big goggle eyes. They call them watchers, owl people. In the book, in, even in the Book of Enoch, the watchers came from Mount Ardon. They came out of a mountain after a cataclysm, and when they came, they had they they taught the people technology. That's what Enoch says. Enoch lists all the things they taught the people: cosmetics, textiles, the weaving. They taught them how to make barrels. They taught them how to make canal works. They taught them weapons. They taught they taught how the women women how how to beautify. They even taught taught spermicides. So all these are listed in the book of Enoch and in the book of Jasher of what the watchers taught men. But <laughs> over century, over many centuries had passed and they had been deified as gods. But the descendants of the Anuna are nothing but the descendants of Caucasians from a cataclysmic period where the Caucasians had surfaced from un the underworld. Now, I'm going to tell you something that's probably going to take you a while to process. I'm not saying you're not intelligent. I'm saying that <laughs> it's going to fracture some of your frames of reference. But I'm telling you we're living in a construct, and that construct is governed by protocols of programming. And I'm telling you right now that what the story that we are told about the ancient past is exactly what we're told about the future. There, there is a continuum here. Revelation is about apocalypse that happens so bad that a whole bunch of people go to the underworld. They stay there until it's all over with. By the time they come up, when they do, it's a new heavens, new earth. They don't recognize anything anymore. What happens in the near future with the tribulation and the apocalypse is no different than what already happened in the past. And what's happening in the near future is about to happen again in the past. We're in a loop. Mm -hmm. those, those of us, those of us who begin to recognize that we are within a construct, those of us who have awakened, is only because the immortal within is now hit that chrysalis period. You are now about to emerge from an avatar that can no longer contain you. This is why you're waking up. So when this reboot happens and sends everybody back to the ancient past to start the program over, there's going to be a lot less participants. <laughs> These people make their exodus. They're gone. They've moved on to a better place. They have graduated this, this simulacrum. This is, what, this, is what, this is the entire scenario. So yes, the Sea Peoples are the direct descendants of the Anuna. Just oh, okay. like, Yes, they so are. They're the also Anuna the first? Of the Amuru. Remember, I talk so, about the Amuru a lot, too. I, which, yeah. The Amuru are Westerners. They are the Sea Peoples. So the Amuru are the Sea Peoples, and they, and they left North America, right, to go over to the African continent. And is that when they became the Anuna, or is this a separate time? Okay. 3439 BC was the first time in the Sumerian records. Remember, this is 12, this is 4,000, this is 432,000 turnings of the stars before the Great Flood, which is 12 centuries on a 360 day year on the Sum right. Sumerian sexagesimal system. So, you are, I don't have to beat that up. You already know that I'm totally against Zechariah Sitchin's half a million year scenario. So, oh, yeah, I've, I've yeah. used my calculator multiple times trying to figure out all kinds of stuff. Yeah, it's, a, it's absolutely ridiculous. So, uh, uh, 3439 BC is precisely 432,000 days before 2239 BC when the phoenix in the month of May destroyed the world and caused the collapse of the vapor canopy when the sun was born. Now, 
3439 BC was the first appearance of the Anuna. Okay. First appearance. They appear with Enki in the historical record. Now, the historical record in the mythological context says that the Anuna had been here before. And it says that, and it says that the black-headed people had been here before. And it said that there was a world before that the Anuno recognized, but they don't give it much much detail. There's also references in the Sumerian text by the black-headed people that there was a god. There was an almighty unseen god, but the Anuna did not talk about him. This is very interesting. There's a recognition in, in Sumerian writings that the Anuna themselves did not regard themselves as gods. That they honored an unseen god. Zechariah Sitchin did talk about this in one of his books. Now, the Anuna appeared in 3439 BC. The story of the birth of Noah, though, is the birth of a whole merging of the Anuna and the local population that was on the surface. The Anuna had no pigmentation. No, They could not produce the necessary melatonin. They'd been in the underworld too long. They had been living under artificial lighting too long. When they came up, in 3439 BC, came down Mount Arden, where, wherever it was, and there were the Watchers. They had these huge eyes. This is why they were called Watchers, the Owl People. This is why the Ori this is why basically Oriental art always shows white people with goggle eyes. This is why the Sumerians actually showed these Anuna statues and busts. These Sumer early Sumerian kings all had lapis lazuli, huge blue eyes. This is what they had. This is what they were known by. And it's because they had been in the underworld for a long time. When they came to the surface, now they needed to perpet in order to perpetuate their existence and pass off their knowledge because they themselves were a dying race. They could not survive on the surface. So they interbred. And this is what the Book of Enoch and the Book of Jasher focus on, that there was an intermixing between the watchers and the daughters of men. The da now, the sons of God are the Anuna. They're just humans, but they're Caucasian. Right. They're Caucasians who came from the underworld. The daughters of men are it's talking about the earthborn. These are the surface dwellers. They had high melatonin. They're human too, but they have high. They have the, their bodies can actually shield themselves from the environment. So the birth of Noah as in the Dead Sea Scrolls tells the story really well in the uh, in the Apocryphon of, of uh, it's either Apocalypse of, of Noah or Apocryphon of Noah and in the Lamech Scroll. In the Lamech Scroll, the whole story is told how Lamech comes home, finds out his, his wife, Bittanash, had a, had a child, and the child looked just like one of the sons of God. He accused his wife of having sex with angels. So... This is what was going on. They were doing in, like in vitro and fertilization. They were doing something because the story is conveying that the men were not having sex with their wives when their wives were suddenly coming up pregnant. And then mm. the children that were being born were, were like white skinned. They didn't understand. Said, These people are not us. These are not our children. This is what the story is conveyed in the Dead Sea Scrolls and in, and, uh, uh, I, I've cited in my Chronicle, and I've cited a couple other traditions that talk about this massive birth of a whole new, like, sub-race. And these are the Caucasians that we know today, such as myself and, 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 and all my Caucasian brothers and sisters. This is how, according to the traditions, we came about because of this intermingling of a dying species from the underworld and a perfectly virile, living, protected, protected branch of the human race that was already existing on the surface, and they had just lost their infrastructure. So the Amuru, after the Cataclysm, are the direct descendants of Shimsu Hor and, of course, the Anuna, uh, the, whole, the whole Noahic race. So... The, that's, a, that's the Amuru. And the Amuru, when they kind of just dis dispersed and spread all over the place, and I've done several videos on their history, uh, from backbone of a giant all the way to more, more recent videos, but the Amuru were directly related to, yes, the Sea Peoples of the Ancient Americas. And uh, uh, the Tamahu that are mentioned uh, in, in the Egyptian uh, uh, temple texts, wall texts. So is it... So yeah, is they're, it, they're all related. They're all related. And none of them, none of them are God. Well, obviously. Um, so then, 
did they bring the technology from North America to Africa? And the and the I believe, I believe, listen, I believe that, but I'm I'm gonna go a step further with that. And I'm gonna say that uh you see this little device right here? Right. This little device? Here in about 17 years, these devices aren't gonna work anymore. Right. At least at least on the surface. Infrastructure will be in intact in the underworld for that technology to continue. Those in the underworld who come up, and remember, this isn't just Jason saying this, Mother Shipton was very, very specific that after the pass of the two dragons, Phoenix and Nemesis X, after the, remember, she said the first dragon will pass one century after a world war. That's 1940. So, that's when it began. That's when the, that's when the actual fighting began. The world war. So, she's dead on. The second dragon comes quickly afterward. This is Nimbus X in 2046. And she's very specific that after the, these two dragons are gone and the surface world is destroyed because man has lost his cities and now he has to rebuild on putrefying and dried out ocean beds. Because everything else that he built formerly, all the former continents are now underwater. Now all the places that were formerly under the oceans are on the surface. And the world has been cleaned. It's a totally new world. It's a totally new heavens. And when this is going on, Mother Shipton was very specific. Men will come up wearing like silver suits from the underworld. And they will, and they will go around... Counting the survivors and then beginning, beginning to teach them how to rebuild. They're going to have things like this. Mm -hmm. The picture she paints about the future is exactly what happened in the past. These little devices were in bags carried by the Anuna, and they were, this is what separated them. This is why the people are like, "Damn, that's a god." He's got that little bag, and every time he pulls the little devices out the bag, the device in the Sumerian text is called a me. It's a tablet. The tablet was so astonishing, all the things that it could do and how the gods communicated together. It was so astonishing that after another cataclysm, which is known as the Great Flood, the collapse of the vapor canopy, humans remembered that history. So they started writing knowledge on clay tablets using a stylus. And the new technology was to burn them in a kiln to make them rock hard to preserve them in the future. They started doing that for two reasons. One, because the gods recorded everything on tablets. So we need right. them too. And, and two, they needed, to, they needed to burn them and make sure they were hard to survive because nothing from the age of the gods survived. Because they didn't, they didn't preserve anything. So the Sumerians were going to correct that. This huge loop we're going through, we've gone through it many, many times. And what happened in the ancient past is going to happen looking forward as well. We're, we're about to enter that period. Yeah, I try to tell people, just take Revelations, put it at the front of Genesis, and then you can figure out how it works. <laughs> yep. Hey, you know what? All the secrets, all the secrets that you need to know in the Bible, they're in three places. They're just in three places. One is the book of Genesis. It's almost like the it's almost like the program for this construct. Then the book of Revelation. This is the Alpha and Omega. This is the Alpha and Omega of the Word. So the third thing you need to look at is only the red letter editions of the New Testament. That's the third element that's vital to understanding Genesis and Revelation. Because that is the voice of something outside the construct that has given us a playbook by which on how to escape the construct. Nothing in, nothing in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John means anything. All the miracles were invented by the Roman Catholic Church. The early fathers didn't mention any of them. Paul does not cite a single miracle of Jesus. Nothing. And there's a reason for that. The red letter editions, just the red letter printing, just the things Jesus said that is a communication from outside the construct to those of those of us on the inside who would like to get out it's a playbook if you follow it you will be one of those who in revelation is being discussed 
To him who overcometh, I will give a white robe. To him who overcometh, I will give you a white stone with a new name. These are what you receive in your participation of the Exodus, which is the symbolism of the Great Pyramid. These are all associated to the Great Pyramid. The Great Pyramid had a white robe too. It was 144,020 ton white limestone, highly polished casing blocks. That's the mantle. This mantle had to be removed. These casing blocks had to be removed so we could see. This is what apocalypse means, to remove the cover. That's what apocalypse means. Apo and Calypteon means to remove the covering. This is what happened in the 14th century AD with a series of earthquakes. It was all by divine decree. These earthquakes shattered that whole beautiful face on the Great Pyramid. And the Muslims came in and they took all that facing off. And they used it for ballast for roads all throughout around Cairo. But it allowed researchers to get into the mysteries of the Great Pyramid and see all these things that no one had ever seen before. This is the, this is the period we're going now. Each stone is the soul of man. Therefore, the apocalypse has begun. Not the Great Tribulation, but the apocalypse has begun. And it's a pretty long period. It's a period of events that begin waking everybody up, those who are going to waken up. So yeah, Genesis, Genesis is the playbook. It's, it's the real contract. Exodus begins the false contract. The elite signed that. They're the ones up under the burning bush contract. The original Abrahamic, Abrahamic contract is really the Brahmic contract. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, the whole story of Abraham comes much later in history than the older version of Brahma and his consort Saraswati. Later it was rewritten, it was Semiticized, but the original was not Semitic. It was Semiticized into Abraham and Sarah. But that's the false version, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't even matter. There are two contracts. The one in Genesis matters because it's a part of the Alpha and Omega. Everything in between doesn't matter. And the, and the Alpha and Omega is in reference to the Word. And the Word is only the red letter editions. It's, it's the playbook that each immortal needs to play by. It doesn't matter what your religious, religion, creed, race, none of that matters. The playbook doesn't care about the religious attachments. It doesn't care about your belief in mythology. It doesn't care about any of these beliefs, individual cultural beliefs that you were saturated with as your avatar was born in certain areas of the world. It does not matter. The playbook applies to all people. It isn't, the red letter edition of the New Testament is absolutely spiritual and it's neutral. It has nothing to do with your culture, race, or creed. So, yeah, Genesis, Revelation, and the red letter edition of the deal. That's all you need to know. Everything else in the Bible is misdirection. Great question. Yeah, great answer, Jason. Thank you. Lee, my brother, please take the, take the floor. You got it. Jason, pleasure to talk with you, brother. I'm almost yeah, through the lost scriptures of Giza, and I have thoroughly been enjoying it. Um, hope you received mine and uh my compliments my book that is uh i've got a ton of questions for you sir i don't know if you remember me i was the, the guy when you were here not too long ago uh asked you about polynesia josephus simon bar Kokma, and paul possibly all being the same critter but uh yeah i do I've remember that. everything from yeah I've, i'd love to pick your brain more about that demonic attack you witnessed in prison uh uh, Babylon being, you know, Egypt, old Cairo, since you just mentioned old, old Cairo, uh, the original Babylon being old Cairo or the Syrian Mesopotamian Persian version that everybody in Christendom thinks. The world flood versus, I've heard you say in previous videos about the Mediterranean localized flood. Um, the pyramid optical illusion, what you wrote in lost scriptures of Giza of how a traveler would see it coming down and ascending from de descending rather from the heavens versus what Bushby wrote in secret in the Bible about them actually having technology that was like levitating stones and building it from the top down. Dude, I've got a, so many questions, a big one that I would love to ask you, but it would require and eat up too much time that I don't <laughs> want to you off. Yeah, I've been enjoying his books thoroughly uh, because I've got a lot of 
three and a half plus years research of my New Testament studies, specifically of the Pauline arc, the, the character that's just one alias that people knows him by. Anyway, but I guess what the one I'll just narrow down and keep it simple so I don't chew up too much time uh, about the big doozy I'd love to ask you sometime, not tonight. Uh, would be the the whole hidden God reference. Because I'd love to pick your brain about Abraham, Balaam, and Laban being the same critter. But the hidden God reference is, is curious, given what you wrote in Lost Scriptures of Giza, how it, seeming, it seems you're indicating that uh, the, the hidden one God of Rastau is none other than Amen, the hidden one. And I'd love to know uh, your thoughts about how it seems that you're indicating I'm mistaken, please correct me, sir, um, that that could be the oversoul uh, benevolent deity, even though uh, I, Alexander Hislop, his two Babylon's book, seemingly indicates that the hidden one, the hidden god, is the one that's associated with Saturn, that obviously the, the Latinos, or the, hidden, the, the, the peoples of Satur, uh, the Saturnian land in Rome, were sacrificing through the gladiatorial games and, and honoring through blood and murder and sacrifice and all that. So if I'm mistaken, correct me, but I'm seeing how lost scriptures of Giza's painting the hidden deity as a benevolent one almost with this Amen character with the what Reverend Hitchcock wrote in 1850-something in to Babylon's with him being almost associated with this negative satanic uh, Lucifer character. Is that just the Reverend kind of having too much Christianese all over his ass? No, or, I, I, uh, I was about to say that. I was about to say that. Look, Hislop's Two Babylon's is a fascinating book, and I really like it. But he goes really overboard on demonizing a bunch of ancient you know, mythological figures and making them more nefarious than necessary, especially kind of going overboard with claiming that almost every ancient god was in some way a man manifestation of Nimrod. He had that pretty bad. But uh, I will say that uh, other than that, the two Babylons was fascinating. I liked it. Uh, I pulled a lot of material out of the two Babylons by Alexander Hislop from a book for a, uh, it's an unpublished book. But I had wrote a, a book, um, The Mighty Hunter of World Mythology, which is the life story of Nimrod and who he, and, uh, who he was in Sumer, Amar Odak, later, later in Akkad Merodak, and later in, in Babylon Marduk. It's all the same individual, Nimrod. So, uh, having said that, I haven't found any references to any evil aspect of, of the Hidden One. What I know is that in the Egyptian pyramid texts, which are among the oldest writings in Egypt. Very interesting fragments of, of, of this body of literature is on monuments all over Egypt. It is well understood from Wallace E. Budge's material that there was no actual Book of the Dead. We're talking about in ancient, ancient Egypt, it was actually called the Book of Life. Only in recent history did somebody change it to the Book of the Dead. But it was called the Book of the Book of Life and the Book of Amenti, and we know that the hidden God is mentioned several times in these in these texts. Also, references in the coffin texts to the hidden one, and we also we also know that the ancient Israelite faith was born in Egypt, not in Canaan, not in Palestine. It was born in Egypt, and they had taken this idea of of the hidden God. Amen is what they had called him. And they had they'd even suffixed many of the Psalms. Some of the more enigmatic Psalms in the Old Testament are suffixed with Amen. So in the in, 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 in the Revelation, we are also given a reference to the Amen in the book of Revelation. So yes, I am absolutely on board with, with Amen being the hidden one. And this is also uh, what we found in the New Testament when Paul, was given a whole, was given, went into a temple precinct, and there was a whole bunch of statues to all the different gods, but the only one that was paid attention to was the statue, the, the little altar of the unknown god. Yes, these are glimpses at the, at the, at the, basically the architect of the whole construct. I'm not talking about AIX, the agitator, the parasite program. I'm talking about the oversoul. Yes, Amun, Amen and the hidden one are simply just references in the ancient Egyptian text and in the Bible to the the oversoul. I don't I don't believe the over the oversoul would ever leave itself out. It would always give small clues that it is itself involved.
All right. Hey, that's a great question, Lee. Um, Jason, yeah, Lee gonna me, Lee's going to have to send me some more emails to, uh, uh, I got a lot more help with my emails now. Back when you sent me those emails, I didn't have any help. I got a lot of help now. I get a lot of emails. Yeah, I think y'all would have a lot to collaborate on. I talked to Lee a bit, little bit about the stuff he's been researching, and it seems like he's got some good stuff that he's found. I'd like to hear it one day, for he's sure. Tony Bushby. He's on the right track if he's reading Tony Bushby. Well, I wanted to let you know, Jason, we're past the two-hour mark, so I wanted to ask you, right. totally up to you. All right, we, we, can, uh, we can take a few more questions. Cool. Uh, Lee, were you done? You, you, okay, we're good. Um, who was next? I think it was Red. I think Red was next. I believe. Wait. Let me make sure I got that right. Anyway, I called you out already. Go ahead, Red. Ask your question. Actually, man, I think Kudman was up first, man. Go ahead. All right. Whoever. Good man, you there? Hello? Hello, hello. Yeah, there you go. Good man. Oh, okay. First time on Discord. Hey, uh, side good. note, Jason. By the, by the way, thanks a lot for, uh, for everything you've done. Um... Side note, I was looking into uh, dinosaurs and come to find out Ty Tyrannosaurus Rex was first found in 1902. Oh, it doesn't surprise me. <laughs> doesn't surprise me. See, it seems like uh, half the world was found in 1902. <laughs> yeah, isn't that the truth? But I'll tell you, the... I studied Neville Goddard for years, and I cannot emphasize enough about retrocausality, which he called revision. And if anyone wants to deliberately create, I'll tell you right now, learn that technique. It will change your life. Well, I'll, I'm on and board I'll with end it. it there. I'll end it there. Yeah, I'm all, I'm on board 100%. It's a uh, we live in such a dynamic construct and our immortality actually actually few I'm talking about it's like a it's like a, a fusion generator when we use imagination with intent. There's there's no doubt. Uh, I whatever problems we're experiencing today, we can literally rewrite yesterday. And just move forward as if the rewritten version was the truth. And variables will start popping into our existence that will reinforce that imagination. No doubt. There's no doubt in my Absolutely. mind. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, what I do is I, I'll go back to an event and I'll change my state. My state of mind and just the state that I'm in. And I'll imagine that. And I mean you know, meditate, whatever you want to call it. I will truly imagine that state. So I am changing the state that I was in back then. And lo and behold, within, I mean, we're talking, it, it could be as quick as a couple days. I start to notice changes in my life. It is I mean, it's like magic. It truly is like magic. No doubt. We're, we're in a magical construct. I, I say that all the time. This is magic. Yes, we are. Well, thanks, thanks again, man. Awesome, man. Appreciate you. Larry, go ahead, man. You're next. What you got? Hey, Jason. Oh. Remember me from Asheville? I was one with a hat. Um, from South Car Are you from South Carolina? No, I'm North Carolina. You from North Carolina? Southern man. Yeah. All right. Anyway, um, yeah, we actually we went to Fort Fort uh, Fort Worth. Didn't meet you there, but we lot, met a lot of the people. But uh, so I got a question and a statement. Um, sure. So first question is, I gave Big John 
some contraband and it, it totally blessed my heart and my wife's heart to see you and your dad enjoying it. And, oh, uh, yeah. So, yeah. So, I'm, so I, my question is, as a distiller, was it good? It was damn good. And listen, my old man's 81 years old. And he knows his alcohols. But when he drank that, he, he said, what the hell am I drinking? This is fantastic. I said, yeah. <laughs> it was so good that I took a picture of both of us and put it on YouTube. Well, I, but, uh, I saw that. Yeah, that was, uh, that was yeah. So that, that blessed our heart. You, you shared that with your, with your, your dad. And well, so, Clay, cool. Clay, let that sit a couple weeks before you try it. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask you that. That's the necker that you sent me? Yeah, that's my yeah, mouth yeah. yeah, I was letting it sit for sure. Uh, I read your I card, still, man. I appreciate it. I, I still, still have half a jar. You. Okay, well, that's good. Um, hey, Larry, I still have half a jar for special occasions. I put that stuff aside that was so good. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. I work hard at it. So, Mother... That was my question. Um, my statement is, you know, when I first started hearing about you, you know, my wife got involved. She was listening to it. And I was listening to him like, I, and I'm going to be honest, I'm like, I'm like, this is fucking insane. There's a lot of people, a lot of people have probably the same idea. And as the more I listen to it, it's like, oh my God, this, I mean, what else could it be? This, this, this is the true stuff. Um, so the, so I want to tell you is I researched you as a lot of people have done and I saw, oh yeah, he was in prison, did this and that, whatever. Um, but you were 17 years old. So I want to say the only difference between you and me, as far as like prison is I never got caught. Yeah. And I'm sure there's a lot of people on archaics who have the same thing. I never got caught. I've done bad shit in my life. I never got caught. You know, I, I, feel, I don't know why. I appreciate that sentiment, but I honestly, I honestly have this belief that we signed up for the roles that we play today and that we're not given guarantees that these roles will be successful and we go through some hard stuff because it's never about the avatar. It's always about the immortal personality. So we have multiple chances but I do believe that we are given templates by which, you know, it's a, well, we don't just jump in here blind. I believe that we're given, we're given decisions. Hey, you've already done this, this, and this. It's time for you to do something like this. Uh, you may affect a lot of people. You may, you may, this may be a role that really benefits you because these last roles, you haven't been very successful. I don't know. I just don't know that part, but I do believe I have this feeling that, that uh, this is something I signed up for. Just like you signed up for yours and whatever past life sims you've lived in the past to get you where you are now to where you have actually awakened. Yeah, this is it's it's all this is all conscious decisions that we made. I do not believe that we are subject to chance like a lot of people promote. I don't believe that. I don't, I don't there's too there's there's too much structure here for chance to be a variable. Well, you know, I like to say I've been awake for over twenty years. Uh Steve Quayle, um, and then I fell into, it, once COVID hit, I, I, I quit my job, I retired, um, but I got into like the whole, you had a video on about the patriotic movement, mm -hmm. you know, I listened to Charlie Ward, and garbage it's just their their you know med beds and the quantum financial yeah. system that's all just garbage it's yeah. it's hopium it's all it was yeah operation so truck yeah I, I get it it's uh it, it, you know it's still going on it's still going strong i mean even right now there's channels promoting the the whole scenario is still being i'm, t I'm telling you they're Galactic Federation is waiting for Trump to send that bat signal. <laughs> I got it. Well, bro, I just wanted to talk to you about that and uh, appreciate what you're doing. You, uh, you got a gift, and uh, I and just keep it going. We love you. Hey, Thank man, you, brother. It was good. It was good meeting you.
I we'll we'll do another meetup in the, in one of the Carolinas pretty soon. Well, I'm working on that. I'm working on it. We got a venue that we're going to. Uh, I remember, I, I I remember talking talk, about. We'll it. talk to Dawn about it. Cool. I know she, we'll talk to Dawn about it, but oh, I just want to thank you. Appreciate it. I'm coming. I'm coming to get some more of that shine. <laughs> Well, I'll make some. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Appreciate you, Larry. And like I said, I appreciate you sending me that stuff, man. I haven't even dived into it all yet, but it definitely looks tasty. Well, so, everything uh, we sent you is homegrown. It's all from uh, our, our bounty. The bread. The bread was wonderful. That sourdough bread. <laughs> that was really good. I, yeah. I'm, I'm a sucker for bread, so. <laughs> um, all right. Thank you. Uh, Red, go ahead, brother. What you got? What's up, man? Not much, yeah. man. What's that, eight, what's that 18 Jay stand Bird. for? What's that? What's the 18 stand for? Actually, nothing, man. It doesn't stand for oh. anything. Oh, okay. That's just kind I'm, of a it's just kind of a random handle that I uh, that I made up. All right. Anyways, dude, I don't. I really don't have a uh, structured question. I sh I should have thought of one. Uh, I'm kind of like a uh, Lee Lee back there. I just wanted to tell you, man, what you're doing is great. Uh, love your stuff. I think I've been following you for about a year now. Uh, awesome. Uh, what, it kind of sucks because I came from J Dreamers, which I uh, don't want to get all into there. Don't even don't even go there. But uh, but uh, thankfully, I did find you, and uh, um. I don't know, man. I don't really know what to say other than. Uh, well, I'm yeah. good. I mean, uh, not everything's about and not everything's about asking questions and answering. Sometimes it's just about communication. You know what I mean? I don't. I don't know you, and you really don't know me. But we we've made a contact right now, and who knows? It might it might bring some type of meaning in the future. You never know, man. Everything well, happens I, for a reason. I do have one question. Maybe you can uh, just say something about, and that's. Uh, well, like I said, I've been following you for a long time, man, and which I've been a truth seeker for, well, forever, for, for as long as I was a kid. Uh, and, you know, I try to talk to these people about this stuff, and, you know, you're really good at articulating what you're trying to say, and I can soak it up and I can understand it, but it's really hard for me to reiterate it, you know, to where other people can understand it. And even if they can, most people don't give a shit, you know? And so I guess that's kind of my question is, if somebody was to ask you, Jason, so you found it out, you figured it out. So why, why care so much, though, now that you have figured it out? What's, what's the motivation? You know what I'm saying? Like my, my wife, for instance. I mean, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll find something out or, or think that I have found something out anyways. And, and I'll look at her, you know, and, and I'll tell her this and like, to me, it's like a light bulb going off. And to her though, it's like, who gives a shit? <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. I understand. But for me, it's a, <clears throat> I just have this inner drive to know things, but right. Uh, it's not. It's deeper than that because I've been out of prison seven years now, and I could be partying. I could be traveling all all the time. I could be doing all kinds of things. I could minimize my life to the point where I could live off YouTube and Archaics TV money, travel for the rest of my life, and just steady put out videos here and there, and and, li and live a life of luxury. I could do that. Yeah, that's what I was thinking I about you too. But I don't before, before I talk yeah. to you. That's exactly what I thought. I said, Jason, I could do that. I, I make you the don't money have for that no now. motive. Yeah, what's the motive here? But, right. But that's not what drives me. Well, money doesn't mean shit to me. I just sent a bunch of money out to different people today, right. and there's somebody in the that. chat. That, there's somebody in the chat that can verify that. I'm just not. I am motivated by something internal that wells up within me that makes me understand that I'm a part of something bigger than me, that there is a family in this construct with me, and it has nothing to do with flesh and blood. There are other kindred souls in this construct that need to hear some of the things that I have learned and I have seen. So 
That, that's what drives me. This is why I have no fear. I don't care about these goons. I don't care about these damn, these, these alphabet agencies that are all over my channel. I don't care about none of that. Right. Unless they step out and actually try to enter my physicality. Right now, I'm not worried about anything at all. I can get real physical. But that's not a war that I can win. Because I'm an immortal being. This is just an avatar. They've got thousands of avatars they can send out at me. So that's not the game I want to play. I'm yeah, the fires are gonna lose. Yeah. Yeah, that's not. I'm just not. That's not. I'm not. I'm. Um. This is a. This is a divine chess game, and I'm a piece. Yeah. I'm not moving the pieces. I'm just a piece. And as long as I continue to do the things that I'm influenced to do, meaning the Oversouls making the moves, as long as I continue to follow that, I'll be okay until the day I exit the construct. When I exit the construct is up to the Oversoul. It's not up to all these goons. I don't care about the opposition. I don't. I don't care. I don't have any fear for it whatsoever. I am motivated by the, by, by the knowledge that I have found some truths and I need to make them known to others because if others carry the torch into the future, that's okay right. if I'm not a part of that. If I have been removed from the okay, uh, uh, the equation, I'm cool with that. I'm cool with that. As long as this is why I sold over 2,000 drives with all my data. Because if anything ever happened to me, I don't care. There's 2,000 people out there that have thumb drives with more information than a man can read in their entire life. So right. I don't care. I don't even care. All my char yeah, I also have the super packs and the survival packs. There's a lot on those. We just upgraded those. We just upgraded the super packs and the survival packs with all the new stuff that I've put on YouTube in the past year. So and then we combined both of them on the same drive and selling it for the same price. So it's not even about the money. I'm a I'm still I'm a uh, money is not even motivating to me, dude. I, I could go to parties. I could I could I could live live lavish. I don't care. All I really care about is that I've got hundreds of videos left in me about some profound things. Like one of my next videos is about the Easter Island heads. You're going to hear things in this video you've never heard in all these Looking books talking to. about Easter Island. Yeah. Right. Easter, and after that, we're going to go to Crystal Skull. I still got many things. You know what I mean? And, and this inner drive, this energy, this, 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 I don't know, this spirituality that keeps me young. You're looking at a fifty-year-old man. I'm still well, like strong. you said, you're a you're a man on a mission. Is I'm a man on is. a mission. Yeah. I'm still strong as an ox. This energy is not mine. It's borrowed, and this imagination is something that wells up within me. But I can't contain it. I can't contain it. There's something else that that flows through within me and uses me for its means, and I'm going to let it. As long as I perceive that it's positive, I'm going to let it. If I perceive see, I, it as... See, I look up to you, Jason, just because of, of what you just said, of, of, of all that. You're a man on a mission. I, and I see what I lack in myself sometimes when I, when I listen to you. I, I, I want that mission myself. And I listen to, well, many, uh, lots of your videos, but I, one that stuck out in my head was... Um, you know, you talked about Hebner, Oklahoma, you know? Yeah. So I live about 45 minutes from there, and I'm thinking, what can I do? You know, he's spitting out all this information. Hell, I'm just right there. What can Sean do? So, uh, I guess you know, what you I'm saying go, is You can go to old libraries in your area and look up the microfish or the oldest newspaper articles in that area, and you'll find out what's underneath Heathner, Oklahoma, because they used to publicize that. They don't talk really? about it in modern publications. But two miles underneath the surface of Heathner, Oklahoma, was a city, and it was found by coal miners. They were they shut the whole mining facility down when the government caught wind of what they found underground. But uh, what year would I look for if I did that? This is this is, uh, this is in the eighteen hundreds. But. Okay. You should look at the microfish in that area for Hevener, Oklahoma. For, you know, somewhere in my Chronicon, I even have the reference of what book I got it out of. Where uh, all the, I even did something on on YouTube. I, I mentioned it on YouTube. That's what I think. That's what you're talking mm -hmm. about. But, yeah, uh, it, it is. is. Yeah, it's, yeah, it, it, it's, it's crazy. I'm from, but listen, uh, it's uh, yeah. you you. I'm listening to you, Red. This is something a lot of people need to hear, but. 
you can't compare spirituality. And this is what I'm hearing from you. I'm hearing from you that you feel this vacuity, that you feel, damn, man, I wish I could do more. And I get all that. But I'm going to tell you, we don't have the God that Judeo-Christianity has told us we have. That's not the God we have. We don't have a God that takes score. We have a right. God that is so forgiving that the selfless act of an instant can actually erase an entire lifetime of guilt. We don't have a, a God that acts in singularities. We have an oversoul that is eternal. And therefore, any one individual act of kindness that is done to one can actually undo all the evil things you've done to many. It's a totally different. The oversoul isn't anything that we have been taught. We're talking about we're talking about a divine personality that is so all pervasive that all the religions in the world can't even describe it. So it's a yeah. I don't. I, that's what I'm saying. If you're in the position in life where you want to do more, then you can. And if you don't have the capacity to figure out what it is you need to do, all you got to do is ask. All you have to do is go soul to soul, is ask the oversoul, hey man, check this out, I've been listening to Jason of Archaics, I understand, shit, I want to do more, I want to help, I don't have his ability for his to recall, to come up with all these facts, what can I do to, to better the human family, what can I do to be of service to other souls out there that are seeking these same things, I promise you, if you have, if you have the time of day, to make that request, I promise you the oversoul is going to give answer. It's not going to be immediate. We don't receive anything in the immediate. You're going to have to be patient for it. When it comes, it's going to be so obvious to you, and you're going to have, you're going to have that fulfillment. And you're going to be able to do what it is you thought priorly you were unable to do. Yeah, man, it's, it's really that simple. Great question, man. Great question. That was awesome. Thanks, Jason. Uh, Red. Uh, men, go ahead, brother. You're muted. You're muted, Red. Or men, sorry. Uh, uh, unmute, unmute, Red. Oh, uh, men. Hit that microphone hey, button. Hey. Oh, this is my... Oh, never mind, sorry. I guess I unset the way. Go ahead. You're good now. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, <laughs> go ahead. Oh, Jason. Clay. How you doing? Hey guys, awesome. I've uh, I've asked you a question last time about the uh, uh, Lithuania and having the Bolsheviks and and all the mess up and started. You inspired me to look into into old history and how all the all the events happened and and uh, certain uh, tiny sombreros moving after the forgiving and and nice uh, Christianity <laughs> and then yeah. subsequently. Uh, the, the the Islamic moving as if not nearby but kind of in the vicinity and I started digging more it appears that more cultures had exactly that same pattern Christianity moves in with a sword with a fire with whatever and then those those other two follow like two shadows in the darkness and one nation that supposedly rejects uh, the Christianity uh, is Japan interestingly and and they try to keep them off and their their uh you know uh, rationale is well soon as christianity moves in tiny sombreros move in and then the the islam moves in mm -hmm. and, and they don't have either of those in 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 big presence in japan but that was just a just a you know research i i, I was doing inspired by 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 your old work uh what you just said in the previous uh, answer uh, jason it was like uh something sparked you mentioned oversoul and your uh you know uh not giving a, a, a crap about the money and the the you know the material gain and all that stuff you're driven by spirit you are actually enacting that uh you know christ's teachings where he said remember to one very rich guy he said sell everything and follow me you are actually doing that and following that inspiration, that uh, uh, oversoul's calling, if you would, uh, they warped and twisted and everything, made it into a Bible, into holy scriptures and, and all that stuff. You dug that out. You dug all this through and actually are living in it. And another thing you said about very forgiving oversoul in an instant, 
in that moment depicted where Christ is, is, is on, the, on the plus and then two criminals next to him and one says that he's actually not guilty and he said tonight you'll be in the kingdom of God. In both those instances that are referenced, yep. Christ says you will enter in the kingdom of God only if you, know, you drop everything, all the attachments in this world and, the, uh, in, and in the other one that instant forgiveness. It's exactly what you're actually not preaching but what you're telling us and you're living with your own example so that was just a you know a, a admiration on that you can comment later but i i had an actual question okay if, if if possible i know we're we're short on time uh when you uh earlier somebody asked about the 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 jewish calendar the 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 the, the, the twisting the 134 year discrepancy mm -hmm. Uh, and then the the contract that the tiny sombrero signed and all that stuff. Do you think? And I've been reading into also trying to find some material. The hypothesis is that after having signed the contract and the elites and some some real controllers of this world, do you think they have an ability to control where soul is being reincarnated? I don't think they're controlling the ability. I think that the system automatically sorts these out according to frequency. And different families, bloodlines, carry different frequencies. And this is, this is, this is, remember, we live in a technological construct. We are spiritual beings experiencing something that is absolutely technologically advanced. So, Oh, it's it's when we it's when we try to process all this information as organic and natural in the world. This is when we go back into the base denominators of thinking that this is an organic reality when it's not. We're only perceiving it so through through the filters of the central nervous system. This is actually highly technologically advanced, so advanced that it took the central nervous system, this amazing piece of technology that we have in our vertebrae, all inside of our vertebrae. That is the interface between the psyche and the simulation itself. So our avatars are absolutely a part of the world that we're experiencing. And we're inside these, these flesh suits. Therefore, these flesh suits, which are, which are genetically coded, are coded within certain families. Therefore, I can definitely see that certain spirits that are vibrating at certain frequencies when they exit the construct are automatically funneled into avatars that are already waiting to be born that are vibrating on those same frequencies. That would explain the, the necessity of them to keep the bloodline and certain traits, maybe trait, certain aspects, because there's definitely been mixing of the bloodlines and all that stuff, but it seems like that parasitic uh, inheritance is continuously passed on from generation to generation. Listen, right? the fanaticism... The fanaticism of the royal families throughout history of intermarrying even their own brothers and sisters if necessary. This, even sons taking their own mothers as, as, as their queens. If there was no, if there was no one else, if there was no other, uh, uh, member of the royal family, this fanaticism is, can only be explained by a hidden family teachings that, hey, I, we got to do this. We got to keep this in the, in the family line because if, if we die, we automatically come back into this, into the same family. But if we weaken our, if we weaken our genealogy, if we spread out too thin, we could be born as lower nobility or we could come back in as a peasant. So yeah. So I can definitely agree that. I can definitely agree that that uh, this this genetic fanaticism has everything to do with the with the elite fearing when they die they won't be born back into an elite family. Apparently, they've been successful because they haven't. <laughs> well, I mean, they're only going to be as successful until there's a reboot. Once there's a reboot, you know, everything gets scrambled. That's what a reset does. The computer does what the computer does. It sets it everything that's wrong. It when you when you reset it, it writes everything and starts everything. The program starts over. Hard reset. Amen. Thank you, thank you, Jason. You gave us so much time tonight. Appreciate it. I think I was the last, uh, you know, asker. Yeah, you're gonna be you're gonna be the last tonight because I'm already worried about my stomach now.
I know. Thank you so much, and really looking forward to 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 getting some some uh, you meeting you in person in some meetup on East Coast. I tried already twice in 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 Texas when you made, and then in in Asheville. I'm I live in Maryland, and actually wouldn't have been too far. Just my kids' family were were I I just couldn't drop and 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 go on a whim. But looking forward to it one day. Well, in twenty hand. look look in the first half of twenty twenty four, we will be in New York somewhere. New York, that's awesome. Yeah. Two, three hours, you'll see a lot of East Coasters, I'm sure. Hey, well, Jason. All right. Hey, it's been good, Phoenix Protocol. Uh, Adam, thank you for, for uh, hosting me tonight. Appreciate you keeping everything smooth. Uh, I'm going to go and get something to eat. Uh, well, whenever the video is ready, ready, you can just send it to me, Adam, and I'll put it on YouTube. And uh, I appreciate you guys. And like I said, we'll keep it two or three weeks, and I'll be back.